Russia recently lost the biggest tank battle of the entire war in Ukraine. Could it mean the beginning of Putin's defeat? This bloody battle over the small coal mining town of Vuladar was part of the still ongoing struggle over the larger Donbass region. Vuladar lies about 40 miles southeast of the city of Donetsk, near the pre-invasion line which divided Ukraine from the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic. And since the start of the year, Vuladar has become a killing field for Russian armor, with the largest tank battle of the entire war taking place there over the span of three weeks. In that time alone, Russia lost over 130 tanks and armored vehicles, forcing Putin to rely on mass infantry assaults to try and retake the position. This was a serious blow, especially since tank warfare has been heavily mythologized in Russia since World War II and has also become symbolic of the broader conflict in Ukraine. And the Battle of Volodar showed yet again that the Russian military has some massive issues that won't be fixed anytime soon. Vuladar. Even the name itself has got a kind of Lord of the Rings dark and creepy ring to it, and with good reason. Here's why. While Vuladar has been the site of small clashes and shelling since the start of the invasion, the main battle for the town began on January 24, 2023. That night, Russia began launching assaults on Ukrainian positions, which would quickly turn into a devastating three-week siege demonstrating Russian failures. At that point, Ukraine was still waiting for sophisticated Western tanks, like the US Abrams and German Leopard 2, to arrive. Russia's replacement armor showed up earlier, but during its first deployment in Vuladar, it got absolutely decimated. Without superior firepower this time round, Ukrainians were forced to rely once again on strategy and tactics. Much of the three weeks took on the same pattern, pitched tank battles along dirt roads and tree lines, with Russians trying to thrust forward in columns and Ukrainians firing on them from hidden defensive positions. If this sounds familiar, it might be because Russia took the same terrible approach when trying to take Kyiv last year, costing them hundreds of tanks. Clearly, Russian commanders didn't learn much from that catastrophe and made exactly the same mistake this time around, advancing their unprotected tank columns into ambushes. So how did this latest embarrassment for Putin play out? Because the terrain around Vuladar is hard to defend, consisting mostly of flat, open plains and light woods, it is hardly ideal for stopping a major assault. But Ukrainians used the terrain to their advantage and applied doctrines of combined arms warfare, which Russian war planners clearly haven't picked up on. The key to Ukraine's victory in the Battle of Vuladar was enforcing Russia to fight on their terms. This meant limiting the battlefield and forcing Russian troops to attack where Ukraine wanted them to. To do so, the Ukrainian military placed hundreds of tanks and anti-personnel mines in the fields outside of Vuladar. Due to the flat landscape and lack of cover, any Russian minesweepers were immediately targeted with artillery fire. But Ukrainian troops didn't just put mines everywhere. Instead, they left clear corridors between the minefields, only large enough for two or three Russian tanks at a time to roll through. If the tanks moved at all from the cleared path, they risked having their treads blown off leaving them totally exposed to artillery strikes. But rather than try an alternate approach to get around the mines, Russian commanders made one of the most basic mistakes in all of warfare, attacking exactly where their enemy wanted them to. When Russian commanders ordered their tanks into battle along these unmined paths outside Vuladar, it left them incredibly vulnerable to the same ambushes Ukrainians have employed since the start of the invasion. Hiding in covered positions near the tank columns, Ukrainian hunter-killer teams set up anti-tank missiles on both sides of the kill zone. Without triggering the anti-tank mines, these teams were able to cross the minefields and dig themselves into strategic positions, often hiding in bushes or abandoned buildings. From there they could fire and retreat with little fear of being hit by tank fire. The main tools Ukraine employed for this stage of the ambush were the domestically produced Stugna P and the American-made Javelin, both deadly anti-tank missiles, or ATGMs. Sometimes called the Skiff, the Stugna P is a less advanced system, but can still pack a serious punch against unlucky tanks. The Stugna is somewhat clunky, weighing about 60 pounds, and relies on manual guidance, requiring its operator to maintain line of sight on the target while the missile is still in flight. But even with these limitations, the Stugna has shown it can be deadly, with a range of up to 3 miles and tandem high-explosive anti-tank or high-explosive fragmentary warheads 
capable of penetrating modern composite tank armor. The Javelin has proven to be even more successful at obliterating Russian tanks. Manufactured by American defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, the Javelin has an effective range of more than 8,000 feet and employs a fire-and-forget targeting system, allowing its operator to flee to safety after firing. Once in flight, the Javelin's missile locks onto the infrared signature of its target and flies in one of two flight modes, top attack or direct attack. While its direct attack mode is similar to the Stugner, the Javelin's top attack mode has proven to be the most deadly against Russian tanks. In this configuration, the missile travels in a high arc, coming down on the top of the least protected section of the tank, just above its barrel. Like the Stugner, the Javelin also features a tandem warhead charge, using a smaller initial blast to penetrate hundreds of millimeters of armor, while the second charge creates a cone of superplastically deformed metal, which can shred the inside of a tank like paper. Both of these ATGM systems were put to good use outside of Vuladar. Among these responsible was Lieutenant Vladislav Bayek, the deputy commander of Ukraine's 1st Mechanized Battalion of the 72nd Brigade, which inflicted much of the damage on Russian armor. Working out of a bunker in Vuladar, Lieutenant Bayek used a drone to spot the first column of 15 Russian tanks and armored personnel vehicles. We were ready, he said. We knew something like this would happen. The Russian officers, meanwhile, clearly did not. Lieutenant Bayak waited until the tanks were strung out between the mined fields before ordering a lightning ambush with the command to battle. Stugner and Javelin operators hiding in the tree lines along the fields opened fire, as did hidden artillery positions further from the road, using American M777 and French Caesar howitzers. Each team was assigned a different section of the Russian column to fire on, focusing on the front and back vehicles first to create a bottleneck. The result was devastating. Tanks in the column attempted to turn and escape the ambush, only to blow up on the mine-laden shoulder of the road. In turn, each destroyed vehicle made it harder for the rest of the column to escape, with blown-up vehicles forming their own roadblock. At that point, Ukrainian artillery would open fire on the trapped tanks, killing the Russians who tried to flee from their trapped vehicles. It ended in obliteration. For three weeks, this pattern repeated itself with Russia losing more and more tanks and, incredibly, refusing to change tactics. At one point, Russian tanks became so stuck that Ukrainians were even able to call in a strike by a HIMARS rocket system, usually only effective against stationary targets like ammunition depots. Ukraine also made excellent use of its own older tanks as well. Because they couldn't outgun the Russian armor head-on, Ukrainians dug their tanks into hidden defensive positions. Some were concealed with bushes and camouflage netting, while others were actually buried in the soil, leaving only their turrets. While not effective against top-attack munitions, these dug-in defensive positions dramatically increased the survivability of Ukraine's tanks from head on fire. And because Ukrainians knew exactly where the Russian tank columns would advance, they were able to range the entire approach for their hidden tanks and artillery. This allowed them to make strikes onto predetermined firing points with high levels of accuracy and not waste their limited ammunition. During each ambush, Ukrainian tank crews also used a range of extremely clever tactics to problem-solve and avoid having their positions detected. The tanks couldn't wait with their engines turned on without giving themselves away through thermal signature or engine noise, but needed to stay warm to be quickly fired up for combat. So Ukrainians placed kerosene-burning heaters next to their engines to keep the tanks ready to go on a moment's notice. Similarly, their hidden positions meant that many Ukrainian tank crews did not have a line of sight to their targets, so they improvised by using drone operators to sight in their attacks. This also added an extra level of confusion for the already bewildered Russian forces, as their front lines were pummeled with unseen tank fire. Their own tanks couldn't locate where to return fire, leaving them essentially blind and helpless. If the Russian columns managed to escape the mines, ATGMs, artillery, and hidden tank positions, Ukraine just used drones to shift their firing positions to fleeing troops and vehicles. And for any tanks that actually managed to retreat back through the kill zone, Ukraine had yet another deadly surprise waiting. In one of its recent shipments of military aid, the United States supplied Ukraine with up to 10,000 specially modified 155mm artillery shells, each filled with nine individual anti-tank mines and a magnetic detonator. Known as Remote Anti-Armor Mine Systems, or RAMs, 
These terrifying weapons were used to mop up any surviving Russian tanks. When a fleeing column would exit the rear of the kill zone, another group of hidden Ukrainian gunners opened fire on their rear, once again trapping them with a rain of anti-tank mines. By employing this strategy again and again against Russians who refused to try other approaches, you can see how Ukrainian defenders destroyed over 100 tanks and armored vehicles in a matter of weeks around Volodar. After a few successful ambushes, it also became clear to Ukrainian commanders that the Russians are running out of experienced tank crews and commanders alike. One Russian tank commander captured outside of Volodar turned out to be a medic who had been given a brief crash course and then sent to the front lines. Because successfully operating even an older tank takes several months of specialized training, there was little chance that the former medic would do anything but get himself killed or captured. And this wasn't a one-off, but a repeating pattern, with almost every Russian officer captured near Volodar having little to no experience in battle. And incredibly, the tank crews these officers were commanding appeared to be even greener. Most were made up of recent conscripts who had, at best, a passing familiarity with whatever vehicle they were operating. This astonishing lack of qualified personnel, while far from surprising, is yet another sign that the Russian war effort is falling apart. Russia lost nearly all of its experienced tank crews during the spring of 2022, during the disastrous assault on Kyiv. The limited number who survived those early ambushes were sent back to the east of the country as Putin limited his war effort. But those survivors were once again decimated during the wildly successful Ukrainian counteroffensive last fall. During that period, the most elite of Russia's remaining tank units, the First Guards Tank Army, was nearly destroyed outside the northern city of Liman. This was the best trained and equipped Russian tank force operating in Ukraine and was supposed to easily hold captured territory. Considering that even this elite unit was not up to the task, it's no surprise that the green Russian troops sent to Volodar have fared so badly. This is a sharp contrast with Ukrainian forces, many of whom were green and terrified when they were drafted or volunteered to defend their country last February. Even though many of those defending Volodar were relatively recent recruits, they learned on the go and didn't make the same mistake twice. Most of Ukraine's most experienced tank crews are currently elsewhere in Eastern Europe, learning to operate the advanced Leopard 2 and M1 Abrams tanks. Yet even the relatively untested troops defending Volodar were able to pull off another staggering victory. This is a pretty clear indication that the war has decisively turned in Ukraine's favor, both in terms of equipment and personnel. It's also yet another reminder of just how poor Russian military doctrine and planning is turning out to be, as neither field officers nor top military brass seem able to learn from past mistakes. Part of this difficulty likely comes from the very structure of the Russian military, which is made up of multiple, independently commanded parts. This lack of a unified command structure has plagued Russia for years and appears to be at least part of the reason why new conscripts are not warned against walking into obvious ambushes. Similarly, the seasoned troops which should theoretically be spearheading such an assault appear to be in much worse shape than expected. A recent intelligence report from the UK found that Russia sent another elite unit, the 155th Naval Infantry Brigade, into the fighting around Volodar. This force is supposed to be among the deadliest in Russia and was utilized in the largest battles last year. But the 155th suffered so many losses that even before Volodar, it was on its third personnel restaffing since the start of the war. As a result, this supposedly first-class fighting force is now staffed mostly by fresh recruits. Adding to the dysfunction is the fact that the 155th was apparently not being sent into combat together, but instead broken up into smaller units and integrated with other commands. Rather than the desired effect of boosting other units' battle readiness, the decision simply made the 155th entirely ineffective. It certainly doesn't help that Russia is rapidly running out of precision-guided munitions and other war supplies. As a result, Russian forces were unable to eliminate the Ukrainian artillery and ATGM positions before their assault on Volodar, assuming they could force their way into the town regardless. Another reason behind Russia's repeated failures in Volodar and elsewhere relates to its heavy use of private military contractors, or PMCs. The most notorious of these is the Wagner Group, headed by Putin confidant Yevgeny Prigozhin. Putin's reliance on Wagner and other groups, as well as the rampant corruption in Russia, has led to a scenario where each is directly competing for the spoils of war. Volodar is near two massive coal mines, 
one of the main reasons why Russia has spent so much time and blood trying to take the town. But since its resources would only likely be given to one PMC, there is a strong incentive to fight over spoils. So at Vuladar, the official Russian military, the Wagner Group, and the Patriot PMC, controlled directly by Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, have all been competing to make the town their own. As a consequence, none of these groups shared information over the potential ambushes, each hoping that the other would take most of the casualties, leaving them free to take over and plunder the town. Controlling the near 70 million tons of coal underneath Vuladar would make either Prigazin or Shoigu far wealthier than they currently are giving them a billion-dollar reason not to cooperate. Of course, this dynamic isn't great for an effective fighting force, and has left Russia at a significant information disadvantage. There's another political dimension to Russia's failure in Vuladar as well. It's clear to pretty much everyone but the Russians that the smart move would have been to move elsewhere and avoid the potential of mines and ambushes. Yet Russian commanders have insisted on bizarre pitched assaults, possibly because of Putin's desperate need for a political win. Anywhere Russian forces have been ground to a halt, the political importance of not appearing to lose a battle has come to outweigh the strategic importance of withdrawing and maneuvering around static defenses. Doing so would be yet another signal of weakness, especially to Putin's most hardline supporters of the invasion. But even so, after the staggering loss at Vuladar, cracks are starting to show. Russian military bloggers of vocally pro-war group have fiercely criticized the endless failed tank assaults. Grey Zone, a telegram channel close to the Wagner Group, posted in early March that relatives of the dead are inclined almost to murder and blood revenge against the general who was in charge at Vuladar. And while the Ukrainian armed forces can be glad of Russia's staggering incompetence, we should never forget the terrible price paid by places like Vuladar. By the end of the Russian assault in February, the town's deputy mayor stated that Vuladar was destroyed, with 100% of the buildings damaged. Of the town's original population of 15,000, less than 500 remain, mostly squatting in ruins and collecting rainwater to drink. While there is no doubt that the battle was a tactical victory for Ukraine, it will also take many, many years before anything can be rebuilt. In any case, it is more than clear that the war's trajectory has changed in Ukraine's favor, and that Russia cannot suffer too many more defeats like this one. But what do you think? Was Vuladar a turning point in the war? And will Russia's repeated failures eventually doom Putin's ambitions? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Imagine trying to invade a country without checking your combat vehicle storage to see if you have enough T-14 Armatas to actually pull it off. Sounds crazy, right? Well, that's exactly what Putin seems to have done in the Russian-Ukraine conflict. You've probably heard it before, but we're here to say it again. Russia is running out of tanks, and it's embarrassing. But wait, Russia's military is supposed to be a force not to be reckoned with. How did it come to this? Is Ukraine so skilled at getting rid of these tanks, or is the Russian army somehow failing at utilizing the ones they do have? Sorry, had. Let's find out. Here's where it all started and quickly went from bad to worse. For Russia, of course. In the little more than a year since Putin began his full-scale invasion of Ukraine and it hasn't quite gone as planned, Russian troops failed to take the capital Kyiv, facing extraordinary resistance from Ukrainians, as Ukraine began to receive advanced military hardware and support from Western countries, Russian troops were pushed back into the east of the country, becoming stuck in a devastating war of attrition. In both the war's early stages and current state of gridlock, one of the most notable trends are the enormous losses of manpower and equipment suffered by the supposedly superior Russian armed forces. Nowhere are these devastating losses more obvious than Russia's supply of tanks. And trust us, if you're waging war, you don't want to run low on those. While recent years have seen a number of predictions about tanks becoming obsolete, the war in Ukraine has demonstrated that they remain critical to modern land combat, featuring heavily in operations by both sides. Putin has repeatedly thrown huge amounts of armor into the conflict, hoping to overwhelm Ukrainian defensive positions. As a consequence, a February report by the London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies found that the Russian military had lost at least half of all its entire pre-war fleet of tanks in the fighting, a figure which has only grown in the months since. In just a single day of combat during March around the key city of Bakhmut, 
Ukraine destroyed 21 tanks, 23 armored personnel vehicles and 8 artillery systems. And as of early April, experts estimate that Russian tank losses exceed 2,000 vehicles in 14 months, while Ukrainian officials put the figure even higher for reference. True, Ukraine has also taken heavy losses, with Russia recently claiming it has destroyed more than 8,300 of the country's tanks. However, Ukraine has been working to crowdsource reinforcement tanks from the West, while sanctions and international isolation have forced Russia to dig deep into its stockpiles from the days of the Soviet Union. That's pretty desperate. Unable to obtain the high-tech components it needs to build modern tanks like the T-14 Armata, Russia is now relying on hundreds of 60-year-old Soviet T-62s and 70-year-old T-55s. This is particularly embarrassing for Putin, who has flaunted his efforts to modernize Russia's military capabilities, spending billions in an attempt to once more turn the country into a superpower. So how did this cringy story of Russia's armed forces losing tanks by the dozens begin? The losses started during Putin's initial attempts to seize Kyiv. As Russian tanks and troops poured into the country, General Colonel Oleksandr Shirsky, the head of Ukraine's ground forces, determined that the Russian columns would need to advance along two or three major highways to enter Kyiv in their blitzkrieg attack. So Sierski organized two rings of troops to defend the city, one in the outer suburbs and one in the capital, with as much space between them as possible, in order to minimize damage to infrastructure. He also moved Ukrainian artillery and mobile anti-tank units into concealed defensive positions to the north and northwest of Kyiv, allowing them to easily target the highways and saving them from Russian airstrikes. This strategy proved to be extremely effective, allowing defenders to destroy many of the slow-moving tanks. But it gets better. There have been reports of entire companies of Russian armor being destroyed in deadly ambushes by Ukrainian hit-and-run teams using anti-tank guided missiles or ATGMs. While relatively simple, ATGMs have proved to be an incredibly effective tool for destroying Russian armor. There are several main varieties of ATGM currently in use by Ukrainian troops. One is the domestically produced Stugna P, an older class of anti-tank weapon also known as the Skiff in its export version. The Stugna P's launcher and missile weigh a combined 60 pounds, making it a relatively large and heavy ATGM. It also relies on operator guidance, requiring its operator to keep tracking the target at all times while the missile is in flight. But even with these limitations, videos have flooded the internet of Ukrainians using Stugna P missiles to devastating effect. The Stugna P has a range from 328 feet to 3.1 miles, with a missile flight time of up to 25 seconds, depending on the target's range. It can also carry high explosive anti tank or high explosive fragmentary warheads capable of penetrating modern tank armor. One benefit of the Stugna P is that despite being heavy, it can be mounted on a tripod, covered with camouflage, and piloted remotely on a laptop-like unit from up to 164 feet away. This has allowed the Ukrainian troops operating Stugnas to keep their units safe from retaliation by Russian tanks and artillery. And the system is simple enough for inexperienced operators to quickly become skilled, such as 42-year-old Ukrainian MP-turned-soldier Tetiana Chornoval. Chornoval worked as a Stugna operator during the Battle of Kyiv, where she and others used a number of hidden ATGMs to throw Russian tank columns into chaos. As she described it in an interview, we saw tanks appearing and we literally ran to our position. I ran to my operator's case, I switch it on, and I see tanks on the screen. They just entered within the range of my missile. I took aim and destroyed the first tank. I shot it right at the fuel cells, and the ammunition was detonated. The tank literally flew off the road and now it is somewhere in the road ditch in the forest. We don't know about you guys, but we're pretty impressed with Tatiana. With hundreds or thousands of stories like this, it isn't hard to see why even Ukraine's domestic ATGM system has proved to be bad news for Russia. Additionally, there are three main Western ATGM systems responsible for the bulk of destruction to Russian tanks. First is the American FMG-148 Javelin, jointly manufactured by defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. Ukraine has received more than 7,000 javelins since the start of the invasion. One of the javelin's biggest strengths is its trajectory, 
as its missile travels in a high arc in order to strike the less armored section of a tank at the top of its turret. Javelins can also penetrate even the toughest tank armor, as they are fitted with two warheads. A primary charge disrupts the anti-missile countermeasures or armor, while a second charge penetrates and detonates inside the tank. However, this also makes javelins expensive at about $200,000 per unit and $78,000 per replacement missile. Cost aside, javelins have become a staple of Ukraine's defense throughout the war so far, even being turned into an inspirational internet meme termed Saint Javelin by Ukrainian-Canadian journalist Christian Boris. Even as the invasion shifted into its current brutal back and forth of artillery barrages and trench warfare, the Javelin has continued to prove invaluable to Ukrainian forces. But Javelins are just the beginning of our How Ukraine is Obliterating Russian Tanks investigation. Also critical has been the Next Generation Light Anti-Tank Weapon, or NLAW, designed and produced by the Swedish company Saab Bofors Dynamics. The NLAW is shoulder-mounted, weighs only 28 pounds, has no backblast footprint, and has a firing range of 65 to over 1,950 feet. Like the Javelin, it utilizes fire-and-forget targeting, requiring no target guidance after firing. It also includes two fire modes, Overfly Top Attack, or OTA, where the missile uses magnetic sensors to detonate just above its target, and Direct Attack Mode. The NLAW is also extremely practical, as it uses a non-explosive soft charge when fired, meaning it can be safely launched from indoors or enclosed spaces. While less expensive than the Javelin, the NLAW still runs at a pricey $33,000 per shot, but with their larger arsenal of ATGMs, Ukrainians have also gotten very good at mixing and matching, using each system in the tactical environment and situations where it will be most useful. As Anatoly, a member of the 128th Mountain Assault Brigade, currently fighting near Bakhmut, recently told a reporter, I'm often asked which ATGW is the best, Enlaw or Javelin. I will say from experience that it is best to use them in tandem. Enlaw is excellent at close range, so it is indispensable when combat action takes place in urban areas like cities and villages, and the Javelin is best at a range of 1 to 2.5 kilometers i.e. in the open field. Similarly, against lighter armored vehicles, Ukrainians will often now use the domestically produced Stugners or Corsars, saving NLAWs for strikes on heavy tanks from concealed, often urban, positions. That's another five starts for Ukraine's fierce weaponry, but we're not done yet. Lastly is the AT-4 anti-tank missile, also produced by Saab Bofors Dynamics, a disposable, recoilless ATGM the AT-4 fires a single shot at a range of 650 to 1,950 feet. Designed during the Cold War, the AT-4 is also highly modular and can be loaded with a range of different warheads, some of which can penetrate tank armor up to 600 millimeters thick. Perhaps the AT-4's biggest advantage is its low cost. Each can be produced for under $1,500 and even less in Sweden. While there are numerous videos of Ukraine's armed forces using them to destroy multi-million dollar Russian tanks, since the invasion began, Ukrainians have also become more and more adept at using their arsenal of ATGMs, making it incredibly difficult for Russia to make any real headway. ATGMs, NLAWs, and AT-4s, oh my! Yes, Putin has been served a number of reasons to reconsider his invasion plans, but Ukraine isn't done providing him with a few more. Here's a terrifying and reliable weapon they've added to the pile. Another critical but often overlooked means by which Ukraine has wreaked havoc on Russian armor is with the use of landmines. Some of these are from the Soviet era, but the US also supplied over 7,000 shells of its remote anti-armor mine system, or RAM, in late 2022. The RAM is a 155mm howitzer shell containing nine anti-tank mines. When the shell is fired over an open area, the tiny mines are scattered across the ground. This means that Ukrainian forces can lay the mines from a distance rather than by hand, without risking fire by Russian artillery. This makes them especially valuable in open spaces, where they can effectively stop an entire tank force. RAM's lethal power was on full display several months later, when Russian armed forces attempted to take the Ukrainian town of Vulodar. 
In mid-February 2023, Russian losses due to the mines were so steep that the British Defense Secretary claimed an entire 1,000-man Russian brigade was effectively annihilated in one day. Reports like this make it easy to see how tank losses have become so enormous. But besides Ukraine's growing supply and talent for using anti-tank weaponry, there is another driving factor behind Russia's loss of more than 2,000 tanks, which has to do with its deeply flawed strategic approach to the conflict. Specifically with the backbone of Russia's invasion force, the Battalion Tactical Group, or BTG, a combined unit of tanks, infantry and artillery designed for lightning offensive operations. As Russian columns were devastated outside of Kyiv in early 2022, it became apparent that the BTG were not proving nearly as effective as they should have been. Most contained far too many tanks and armored vehicles, with too little infantry support. So when they came under attack by Ukraine's mobile strike teams, there were not enough soldiers to repel the ambush, and Russian tanks were easy targets. This was compounded by Russia's failure to establish air superiority, which meant it was unable to supply close air support for its tank columns, the way the US did in Iraq and Afghanistan. Combined with Russia's myriad issues resupplying its front lines or repairing broken-down vehicles, and you begin to see just how things went so badly so fast for Putin. And because of all the elements above, Russian tank losses have only grown heavier in the following months of the war. During Ukraine's autumn counteroffensive into the Kharkiv region, for instance, Russia was losing as many as 10 battle tanks per day to Ukraine's two, despite the fact that Russian troops were on the defensive. Most of the tanks destroyed were T-80s and T-72s, which began Russia's critical shortage of those systems. During that same period, Ukrainians reportedly captured over 560 vehicles and hundreds of extra ATGMs. Thus, in the grinding stalemate which has followed, Putin has had to rely on older and older equipment, most notably the T-55s and the T-62s. The T-55 is so old, it literally qualifies as antique. The tank's prototype was first completed in 1945 and entered service with the Soviet Army in 1958. But reports indicate that in March of 2023, Russian troops began moving hundreds of them out of the 111th Central Tank Reserve Base in Khabarovsk, where they had been sitting in long-term storage for many decades. A recent photo showing a Russian soldier posing next to a T-55 somewhere in Zaporizhia Oblast seems to confirm their presence on the ground in Ukraine. The photo also indicates that Russia is sending the T-55s to Ukraine without upgrading them, as the tank in the photo appears to have the same infrared optics that were being used in the late 1950s. Similarly, there is no evidence that the T-55s have been reinforced with modern explosive reactive armor and seem to be using the same thin steel body plating as they did during the early Cold War. This may prove to be an especially bad decision since the T-55s also include the so-called jack-in-the-box floor, which has doomed many of Russia's other Soviet-era tanks. Unlike modern battle tanks such as the German Leopard 2 or US M1 Abrams, which keep their shells away from the crew behind thick armored walls, older Soviet tanks store their ammunition in a carousel-style automatic loader, sitting directly below the main turret and crew, with only thin steel armor a well-placed enemy shot can ignite the ammunition and easily blow up the tank. As Professor Robert E. Hamilton of the US Army War College put it bluntly, for a Russian crew, if the ammo storage compartment is hit, everyone is dead. He adds that the force of the explosion will instantaneously vaporize anyone unlucky enough to be inside. And that's far from the ancient tank's only weakness. As military journalist David Axe has written, the T-55 is from a generation of armored vehicles before modern optics, autoloaders, and multi-axis stabilization for their main guns, passive infrared optics, and sophisticated computerized fire controls. Essentially, all this makes the T-55 far less accurate and powerful than any other tank on the battlefield today, leaving them as easy targets for Ukrainian ATGMs and artillery. The Soviet T-62 isn't a whole lot better. It also suffers from poor armor and the jack-in-the-box floor, as well as limited range and firepower compared with any modern tank. First introduced in 1961, the T-62 was once considered cutting-edge, even into the 1970s. 
Many are equipped with either a TSH-2B41 or a TSH-SM41U gunner's sight and active thermal sights, which allow a T-62 gunner to fire about a mile during the day and about half that at night. This is about half the range of most modern tanks, making the T-62 a sitting duck in many situations. In an effort to slightly improve their effective range, Russia has so far pulled more than 800 T-62s from long-term storage and fitted many with 1PN96MT02 analog thermal gunner's sights. These sights are an upgrade from the T-62's original design, but have not been state-of-the-art since the 1970s, and have mostly been long since replaced with digital Sonsu-U sights. But since the Sonsu-U includes advanced French components now unavailable to Russia due to sanctions, they have had to make do with the older analog sights, making them essentially target practice for Ukrainians. Another huge issue with both the T-55 and T-62 is their discrepancy in barrel and ammunition size. Newer tanks such as the T-90, T-80 and even the T-64 being used by the Ukrainians have the same size barrel and can use common shells. By contrast, the barrel of the T-62 is 115mm and the T-55s is 100mm, meaning both that they cannot use modern ammunition and that they have issues destroying heavily armoured targets. Making this worse is the T-55 and T-62's incredibly slow rate of fire, while the crew of a Ukrainian T-64, Leopard 2 or M1 Abrams can fire 10 to 12 rounds a minute, a T-55 or T-62 crew is lucky if they can manage three or four. This reality is likely to get an even greater number of Russians killed in direct battles with Ukrainian forces as they become more and more outgunned. At the same time, Russian tank losses and reliance on older hardware has come hand in hand with catastrophic levels of casualties. The country is so far estimated to have lost some 200,000 to 250,000 soldiers. For reference, that is more than the US has lost in every one of its wars since World War II combined. In response, Putin has been forced to enact conscription, augmenting the Russian front lines with untrained conscripts, hardened criminals, and mercenaries. These troops are essentially forced to attack at gunpoint, and thousands have instead opted to mutiny, flee, or surrender to Ukraine once they reach the front lines. These mind-boggling numbers have also affected the Russian military's ability to properly resupply its tank personnel. Many of the 2,000 tanks already lost were destroyed with their crews still inside, leading to a serious shortage of soldiers with actual experience operating tanks, especially the more modern ones. Ukrainian analyst Oleksandr Kovalenko was recently tracking the shipment of more than a dozen restored T-72s, T-80s and T-90s to a Russian unit near Svatova in eastern Ukraine. But when they arrived, Kovalenko noticed that the most interesting thing is that there are no crews in the unit who can operate these tanks. Replacement crews for T-55s and T-62s can be trained in a relatively shorter time frame, as they do not need to be trained to use automatic gun loaders or sophisticated modern fire controls. The downside of this, of course, is that Russia now has extremely green soldiers using what amounts to rusting, obsolete weaponry. Down the road, this will create even more issues as the crews currently being trained will not be able to effectively operate the more modern tanks, even if Russia is able to start their production. This degradation of manpower and training could prove to be an even bigger issue than Russia's dwindling military supplies, as effective recruiting and training will become harder and harder. Long term, this could spell disaster for the Russian military and perhaps for Putin himself. With no way to replace modern tanks or the crews needed to operate them properly, it may prove impossible for Russia to remain a global or even regional power. The very presence of T-62s and T-55s on the battlefield is an indictment of Russian power and a sure sign that its armed forces are flailing. But what do you think? Will Russia's tank losses be a defining factor in the outcome of the war? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more content from military experts. First, tanks and now submarines. Putin can't seem to keep hold of his weapons, with Russia's only aircraft carrier catching fire not once, not twice, but three times since 2018, and his guided missile cruiser the Moskva sinking in 2022, Russia's navy, widely considered one of the most powerful in the world, has seen better days. And now, 
Russia's submarine power is under serious threat. Here's why. It's no secret that things haven't been going well for Russia, from crushing sanctions to staggering military casualties. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has backfired in a host of unexpected ways. It has also highlighted profound weaknesses in Russia's military capabilities, exposing them as aging, corrupt, and poorly led. Nowhere is this more true than at sea. Despite statements by former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev back in 2009 that, without a navy, Russia does not have a future as a state, the country's surface fleet remains embarrassingly inept. Former US Navy Admiral James G. Foggo recently noted that it has been allowed to atrophy due to factors like poor maintenance, low funding, and corruption. This trend has been on full display during recent years, with the Russian Navy suffering a number of embarrassing high-profile mishaps. Its only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, nicknamed the unluckiest ship in the world, has caught fire at least three times since 2018. Earlier this year, Ukrainian intelligence assessed that the ship is in critical condition and not capable of moving under its own power. That's not to mention the sinking of Russia's Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, in April 2022. But now there's an even bigger problem for Putin, one deep below the waves. For all the issues with its surface fleet, Russia's current fleet of 58 submarines have been long considered among the most powerful in the world. This includes 11 nuclear-powered ballistic missile subs, 17 nuclear-powered attack subs, and 9 nuclear-powered cruise missile subs, with several more on the way next year. While they haven't been a factor in Ukraine, they are still considered a critical threat by the US military. However, their power may not last forever. Recent reports suggest that Russia's submarine capabilities are being seriously harmed by the backlash to its invasion, especially through the crippling effect of Western sanctions. So what does that mean for the future of the Russian military? And just how serious of a blow could it be to Putin's war machine? To understand just how critical Putin's submarine problem could be, we first need to take a quick look at some Russian naval history, which, funnily enough, is permeated with continuing and humiliating losses of fleets. But wait, there's a plot twist, and it occurs just after World War II. Russia has had military power at sea in one form or another since 1696, when Peter the Great first established the Imperial Russian Navy. Impressed by his visits to Western Europe, Peter realized that Russia could never be a true great power while remaining landlocked. By 1710, he had over 58 ships in his fleet, and despite some defeats, by Peter's death in 1725, Russia was the dominant sea power in the Baltic. During the reign of Catherine the Great, the empire's ambitions at sea had grown, establishing a new Black Sea fleet and annexing Crimea for the first time in 1783. By the time of her death in 1796, Russia possessed the world's largest navy after Britain. This period was the height of Russia's imperial naval power. As naval historian Robert A. Theobald once put it, to my mind, the death of Catherine marks the high watermark in Russian naval history. From this date to the end of the imperial navy, it was on a treadmill working hard but getting nowhere. This became obvious during the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856, where Russia suffered a stinging defeat to the combined forces of the Ottomans, France, and Britain. The shortcomings of the Imperial Navy were even more obvious by the time of the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War. But it gets worse. In response to Russian expansionism in the Far East, the newly industrialized Japanese military gave Russian Tsar Nicholas II a humiliating defeat at sea. The war marked Japan's emergence as a great power and contributed heavily to the first Russian Revolution of 1905. Following the Second Revolution in 1917, what remained of the old Imperial Navy came under control of the Soviet Union. And while Lenin and Stalin both aimed to rebuild a powerful Soviet Navy, it remained largely inept throughout both world wars and into the early 1950s. As Theobald described it in his well-known 1953 presentation at the US Naval War College, this is the history of a navy which has lost more complete fleets than any other navy in the world. It is the history of a navy which has never been more than second rate that has never been decisive in world history and that has never developed a depth of tradition to compare with those of the Western navies. But this would change drastically only a few years after his assessment, mainly due to one factor, modern submarines. While Russia had some early submarines before World War II, the first modern Soviet ballistic missile submarines were completed in the late 1950s. 
These early Soviet models were diesel-electric and based on designs pioneered by the Germans, similar to the United States. However, by 1960, the Soviet Navy had launched its first nuclear-powered attack submarines, giving the USSR below-surface capabilities greater than perhaps any country except the US. Soon after, the Soviets also developed nuclear SSGN-class subs, running on nuclear power but designed to launch limited ballistic missile strikes against American aircraft carriers and other naval deployments. Over the next three decades, the Soviet Navy continued to build and maintain a large fleet of submarines, relying on them heavily to challenge America's greater military strength during the Cold War. Because the true names of Soviet subs were rarely known abroad, most are still referred to by NATO codenames, such as the Alpha-class nuclear subs. These use liquid metal-cooled reactor propulsion systems and titanium hulls, enabling them to move extremely fast, over 43 knots, or 80 kilometers an hour, at an operational depth of 2,000 feet, or 600 meters. Also important to Soviet deterrence and power projection were the Typhoon-class subs. The largest submarines ever built, Typhoons are over 563 feet, or 172 meters long, have a beam of 81 feet or 25 meters and can carry up to 20 Sturgeon nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. These were just a few of the many varieties of subs developed by the Soviet Navy, and the Soviets also continued heavily building diesel-electric models as well, such as the Kilo-class attack subs and others. The fleet was never able to make the switch to fully nuclear-powered, largely due to budgetary and technological constraints. However, by its peak in 1980, the USSR's submarine force had 480 boats, including 71 fast attack and 94 cruise and ballistic missile submarines. Even following the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, this submarine fleet remained a major part of Russia's naval power. Dmitry Gorenberg of the Center for Naval Analyses has noted that during the post-Cold War period, Putin has focused on developing new submarine capabilities, while Russia has essentially lost the ability to construct new, advanced surface vessels. The most advanced of these submarine developments are the Yasin and updated Yasin M-class SSGNs. Developed in the 1990s and early 2000s, Rand Corporation researcher Edward Geist has described these as the crown jewel of the contemporary Russian Navy and perhaps the pinnacle of present-day Russian military technology. And according to Admiral Fogo, one major advantage of the Yasin-class vessels is that they are very quiet, which is the most important thing in submarine warfare. They can also carry both Sircon hypersonic and long-range caliber cruise missiles. Yet these deadly subs also come with a hefty price tag. The Severa Davinsk, the first Yasin-class model, reportedly cost over $1.6 billion. While this is still much cheaper than the US's most advanced subs, it is a very high price tag considering Russia's far smaller economy. In the past few years, Putin's government has also claimed that even more nuclear subs are in the works, including what Russian state media claim to be a new division of submarines carrying nuclear-capable super torpedoes in the coming years. Nick Childs, senior fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, has argued that investments in submarines up to this point are one of the only things which has allowed Russia to maintain its status among the leading powers. While its fleet is still far smaller than during the Soviet era, Childs points out that it remains very capable and along with some of the older submarines would still pose a threat to NATO, both at sea and against land-based targets. But even before the war in Ukraine, there were some doubts about the true effectiveness of Russia's impressive-seeming subs. While they are doubtless in better shape than its surface fleet, they have never been truly tested in combat. So how are Putin's submarine fleets faring in the Russo-Ukraine conflict? On land, the reckless nature of Russian military doctrine has been on full display in the invasion of Ukraine. But despite the enormous losses by Russia's ground forces, its navy has so far played a very limited role in the conflict. This includes its submarines, which have remained mostly as a nuclear deterrent and threat. The exception to this is Russia's Black Sea Fleet, where submarines off the coast of Sevastopol and Novorossiysk have been used to fire caliber missiles into Ukraine. None of these subs have so far been damaged or destroyed, and there are still concerns that they could be used to counter NATO activity and control trade routes in the Black Sea. But the consequences of Putin's invasion have created a different kind of problem for the Russian Navy and its submarines. 
The crushing regime of Western sanctions imposed on Russia has begun to erode the country's ability to resupply and maintain its military industry. And in December of 2022, the US State Department added even more sanctions directly targeting Russia's naval power. These have already begun to work, cutting Russia off from the technology required in modern subs. As Admiral Foggo told Newsweek in an interview, I think they have been severely crippled by these economic sanctions and by their own foolishness in the war in Ukraine. In particular, the maintenance of existing subs and development of new ones will become increasingly difficult since, when they don't have the raw materials, they can't sustain the industrial base. They don't have the manpower because that manpower is going into fighting the war in Ukraine. Military losses and brain drain make it likely that Russia will lose its ability to compete with Western countries in submarine development, especially when it comes to their ability to project power. Graham P. Hurd of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies argues that the protracted nature of the conflict and the coming Ukrainian counteroffensive undercuts Russian military credibility. The repeated military failures in Ukraine have created growing pressure in Russia to project an image of strength through its submarines. In turn, this has incentivized the Russian Navy to take greater risks by using submarines which are not seaworthy and fast-tracking new weapon systems without proper testing. Heard added that submarines are the most expensive ticket item in Russia's military budget and have no obvious utility in this war so Russia compensates and projects power through acceptance of greater risk. As a consequence, Russia's submarines will suffer indirect and long-term damage the longer the war lasts. Similarly, Heard and other experts have pointed out that the sanctions illustrate just how much of Russia's military-industrial complex was, and remains, reliant on critical Western technology. Without the advanced components for submarines manufactured in the US, UK, France, Germany and elsewhere, Russian development will be seriously stunted in the years to come, and there are almost no alternatives to the technology which sanctions have cut Russia off from. Parts from China and Iran, for example, are not advanced enough to meet Moscow's requirements. While experts remain divided on just how dependent Russia's nuclear submarines are on Western tech, it's pretty clear that at least some of the imported components are necessary to build new vessels. These are mostly thought to be technologically advanced electronic components for guidance, communication and missile deployment. Russian defense journalist Alexander Timokhin wrote in January that the sanctions imposed on Russia after the special military operation left a sharp imprint on the country's technological capabilities. The production of radar complexes, communication systems, guided missiles, sonar equipment and other similar systems has proved to be difficult. As a consequence, these restrictions could make it nearly impossible to build Yasin and Yasin M-class subs and other highly capable boats. Childs from the International Institute for Strategic Studies points out that this trajectory is already visible, as while the newest Russian submarines are very capable, Russia's inefficient shipbuilding industry has struggled to deliver them on time and in significant numbers. Like other experts, he agrees that Russia's construction shortfalls will accelerate in the coming months and years since this could well be exacerbated by the increased demands on other sectors of the defense industry as a result of the war, as well as from the impact of sanctions on certain key components. So what do these deficiencies mean for Putin's ambitions and the future of the Russian military? Well, experts have outlined two main possible scenarios for the future of Russia's submarine fleet. One possibility is that as military resource constraints continue to grow, it will lead to prioritization of the elements which have been most impacted especially ground forces. As of May 2023, Russia has lost nearly 200,000 soldiers, a truly staggering figure for a modern military. In turn, as one analyst put it, that will inevitably lead to cuts, or limits at least, in shipbuilding in the future. The other possibility is that Russia will be forced to funnel more investment into submarines due to their relative importance and strategic value. This will mean less and less resources for replenishing ground troops and equipment which are both cheaper and more expendable. But even if Putin opts for the second scenario, any money spent now is likely to have a delayed impact. Past investments in submarine development and maintenance will carry the Russian fleet for at least a few more years to come, but within five to ten years, it could be a very different picture. Just based on the size and current capabilities of Russian submarines, 
it will likely remain one of the world's most powerful fleets for the next decade. But after that, things are far more uncertain. Any modern submarine which breaks down in the years could become essentially useless, reduced to just so much expensive scrap metal. However Putin attempts to manage his growing economic constraints, the main role of Russian submarines will probably remain as a nuclear deterrent. And there are also some indications that Putin has already realized just how spread thin his resources really are. In March, Russia's Pacific fleet underwent a series of military drills which were described as a surprise inspection of more than a dozen submarines, potentially signaling a lack of faith by the Kremlin in the readiness or maintenance of the fleet. Readouts from the Kremlin show that Putin recently told Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu that while Russia's priorities remain the war in Ukraine, still, the objective to develop the Navy, including in the Pacific Theater of Operations, remains relevant. Adding that, it is clear that some of the fleet's assets can be used in conflicts elsewhere. This indicates both that Putin does not believe submarines can make much of a difference in Ukraine, and that they remain most useful as a nuclear deterrent. As Russia's submarines begin to break down in the coming years, with no easy way to maintain them or build new state-of-the-art models, the country will also become less able to project power in this way. This will almost certainly happen, regardless of where the Kremlin prioritizes resources, especially since casualties in Ukraine show no sign of slowing down. As losses climb higher and higher, and as sanctions continue their squeeze, it may also provoke Putin into even more aggressive and reckless strategies. In fact, there is evidence that this is already taking place. In the past few months, Russia has deployed submarines in increasingly threatening positions. As Michael Peterson, the director of the Russia Maritime Studies Institute, told Newsweek, we have indications that nuclear-powered submarines have been deploying off the coast of the United States and into the Mediterranean and elsewhere along Europe periphery, in ways that mirror Soviet-style submarine deployments in the Cold War. Such aggressive posturing is likely tied to Putin's growing issues in an attempt to project a facade of Russia as a true global power, despite an economy less than half the size of California. This weakness is also reflected in overly optimistic predictions for its military-industrial complex. A recent analysis by the Institute for the Study of War ISW concluded, similarly to other experts, that Russian officials continue to claim that Russian defense manufacturers are increasing production amidst ongoing indications that the Russian Defense Industrial Base DIB, is unable to meet Russia's long-term economic and military goals. There have been rosy claims by officials like Alexei Rachmanov, head of the Russian United Shipbuilding Company, that submarine production time will soon be cut by 8 to 13 months. But there is little evidence to support this. And in another sign of growing weakness, Putin signed a decree on February the 27th, reducing previous plans to construct at least three nuclear reactor-equipped LIDAR-class icebreakers by 2035 down to just a single vessel. Again, this likely reflects the fact that the need to replenish the stocks of conventional ground weaponry lost in Ukraine will likely consume the majority of Russia's DIB and limit Russia's ability to produce systems aimed at longer-term strategic goals. This includes both nuclear icebreakers and submarines, indicating that Russia's resources are spread much thinner than Putin would like the world to believe. So, to sum up, despite the claims by the Kremlin, there are strong signs that Russia's disastrous strategy in Ukraine has backfired even more than we know. The squeeze of Western sanctions now threatens to render even the deadly Russian submarine fleet obsolete. The longer the war goes on and the more isolated Russia becomes, the harder it will be to obtain the advanced components needed for these vessels. This will continue to erode the country's industrial base, possibly crippling all long-term defense production. And because Russian losses in Ukraine are so heavy, Putin also faces a crisis of credibility and growing pressure to project a facade of power. This has already led to reckless, aggressive posturing by Russian subs and a willingness to use vessels which are not even seaworthy, a problem which seems likely to increase because the Russian Navy has historically been so reliant on them to project power, there is little question that the stagnation of its submarine fleet will be a serious blow in the coming years. But what do you think? Will sanctions and battlefield losses eventually doom Russia's submarine fleet? Or can Putin find a way around these issues and keep Russia as a great power? Let us know what you think in the comments section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. As if losing tanks by the dozens and terrified conscripts by the hundreds 
on a daily level wasn't bad enough, Putin has now been betrayed by one of his own. And you won't believe this guy's getaway story and what he revealed about the maniacal Russian dictator. Here's the thing. When you're fighting a war, information is everything. The more you know, the more effective you'll be on the battlefield. And if you're looking for an edge over your enemy, the best intelligence often comes from the source you least expect. One such example hit global newsrooms just recently when a high-ranking defector from Vladimir Putin's inner circle decided enough was enough and escaped to the West. How did he do it? Why did he do it? And most importantly, what did he reveal about Putin the leader and the state of his forces in Ukraine? Join us today and find out. In mid-October 2022, Gleb Karakulov, a member of Putin's elite personal security service, concocted a daring plan. A graduate of Russia's Mozhaisky Military Space Academy, he had risen through the ranks of Russia's Federal Guard Service, becoming a captain and engineer in the Presidential Communications Directorate. Impressive technical skills rewarded Gleb with important jobs. Among them, he became responsible for arranging and providing secure encrypted communications to and from Putin's presidential and the prime minister's office on their foreign visits. This role exposed Gleb to a flood of classified information, as well as the routine and private affairs of Putin's inner circle. Let's put it this way, Gleb found himself smack in the middle of information central, and it was a prestigious, important job, but one that soon began to grate against his moral compass. For Gleb, the February 2022 invasion changed everything. By late 2022, Putin's ruthless tactics, Russia's changing fortunes, and the criminality demonstrated by average Russian soldiers in their deployments to Ukraine caused many Russians to begin quietly opposing the war. Gleb himself never participated specifically in Russia's military activities, but racked by internal guilt and aware he was implicitly supporting an authoritarian regime bent on executing its leaders' criminal orders, he found himself among this group disillusioned by the brainwashing propaganda and hypocrisy at every level of society. What this guy did next took no small amount of courage. Just two years from retirement from the FSB, Gleb made a monumental decision. He decided he wanted out. I could no longer make compromises with myself, he later told interviewers. I couldn't remain in the service of this president. I consider him a war criminal. Even though I am not directly involved in this war, it's no longer possible for me to carry out his criminal orders or stay in his service. It wasn't only Putin's behavior that put Gleb off. During his travels in the initial phases of the war, Gleb noted how casually his FGS colleagues talked about the bloodshed and devastation Russian soldiers were inflicting on Ukraine. According to Gleb, they would savor every detail of what was happening in the war, even taking pleasure in these discussions. I can't describe how disgusting and unpleasant it was, he continued. I don't know, I had this feeling of total disgust. I decided to quit. We get it, Gleb, and we're with you on this. His decision coincided with Putin's September mobilization order that raised a new wave of Russian conscripts for frontline service in Ukraine. This posed a major problem for Gleb. He could terminate his contract, but if he left the service he knew under the mobilization he would immediately become a reserve officer, consigned to the front after his discharge. He would not be party to a criminal war, on or behind the front lines. It was as simple as that. So with his decision made, what would he do next? The problem was picking the right moment. Gleb had an incredibly important job. Every time the Russian president or prime minister traveled anywhere, he would go ahead as the leader of an advanced team, with enough specialized communications equipment to fill a Kamaz truck. Over 13 years, Gleb made more than 180 trips, each ensuring Russia's political elite could safely communicate with their colleagues from anywhere in the world. Because of his routine travels, he decided the best time to escape would be when he was far from the Russian metropole, at least far enough to be near somewhere with an airport that could get him into a pro-Western country. But he had to pace himself. Timing was everything. In October 2022, the opportunity finally presented itself. Here's how he pulled it off, and it's genius. Russian heads of state were scheduled to fly to Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan, to attend a regional diplomatic summit. Naturally, Gleb went ahead, to ensure Putin and his staff's communications were securely installed. It was there, however, where Gleb hatched his wily plan. On the final day of his business trip, he told his colleagues he wanted to go souvenir shopping after his shift, 
While there, he prepared the next phase of his plan, the getaway itself. When colleagues began texting him asking where he was shopping so they could meet up with him, he told them he had developed stomach cramps and needed to rest in his hotel room. Little did they know, Gleb was already on his way. That afternoon, he picked up his wife and daughter who had come to Astana under the pretense of visiting Gleb, took a taxi to the airport, and prepared to board a flight to Istanbul, Turkey. Gleb must have been feeling the pressure at this point. His colleagues would soon become suspicious. The minutes ticked by. The passengers prepared to board. And then, an unexpected announcement made Gleb's heart sink. The flight was briefly delayed. He had to act quickly. Knowing his colleagues would be looking for him, Gleb turned off his phone. There was no turning back now. An hour later, he boarded the plane with his family. Relief swept over him and his wife as the flight attendants sealed the door. He had made it, but he was now a wanted man. Gleb Karakulov's escape officially made him the highest-ranking intelligence officer in Russia's recent past to defect to the West. By the time he landed, his phone had been bombarded with messages asking him where he was and what he was doing. Others who had caught on labeled him a traitor. His FGS operations department officer tried to get in touch. Gleb never responded. In Istanbul, Gleb and his family were met by Katya Hakim, a member of the Dossier Center, a London-based group funded by Russian opposition figure Mikhail Khodorovsky. The Dossier Center transported Gleb to a secure flat in an undisclosed location and began to meet with him in person. He agreed to give an exclusive interview before going public. Gleb was clear on his rationale for giving such a high-profile interview so soon after his escape. Russia's illegal invasion and occupation of Ukraine has thus far divided Russian officials, politicians, and elites, but until now, few have had the courage or audacity to publicly condemn Putin's actions. Gleb told his interviewers he wanted to speak out to express his opposition to the war in Ukraine. Above all, he wanted to tell his Federal Guard colleagues and all Russian citizens to do something that they should not believe the war has anything to do with Ukrainian aggression. So what did Gleb say? Ironically, the biggest and most oft-repeated observation from the interview came as the least surprising. Since the start of the war in Ukraine, Putin's paranoia has gone into overdrive. Putin is pathologically afraid for his life. He spends most of his time at his residences, reinforced safe houses the media has aptly labeled bunkers. This is hardly shocking, self-preservation is priority number one in every dictator's handbook, but Putin seems to take it to another level, leading an isolated, cocooned existence cut off from reality. Putin does not use a mobile phone, at least Gleb had never once seen him with one in all his years of service. And why would he? Mobile phones can be hacked, bugged, or compromised, an unnecessary security risk for heads of state. Gleb said that contrary to Putin, Whenever the Russian Prime Minister goes on business trips, a senior aide in charge of internet access will accompany them, using a laptop with secure access to look things up as necessary. Putin requires nothing of the sort. What's the point of the internet for Putin, Gleb remarked. He only receives information from his closest circle, which means that he lives in an information vacuum. This is worth exploring more. In his self-incurred isolation, the Russian president essentially gets his information from three sources. One, his inner circle yes-men who tell him everything he wants to hear, two, authorized reports from his military intelligence and security services, and three, yes, you guessed it, Russian propaganda. Putin insists on having a Russian TV everywhere he goes, and this is significant. He loves watching his own sensationalized propaganda espoused by raging pundits who exaggerate the nobility of Putin's war and minimize its global repercussions. We all know someone like this. People who spend so much time in their own echo chambers, they become convinced they are the only ones who can see the world as it really is. The irony is that the more they feed themselves information from one side, the more unbalanced their perspective becomes. Putin takes this to the extreme. We shouldn't be surprised, but it has been said that many of the reports he reads from his intelligence services are extremely flawed. Allegedly, an FGS report issued before the war claimed the Ukrainian people would greet Russian troops as liberators. Something we now know turned out to be completely false, but this report was apparently a key factor in Putin's decision to invade to begin with, a misguided venture that has resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, with no end in sight. Putin's paranoia manifests itself in other ways too. According to Gleb, Putin is so self-isolating he continues to observe strict quarantine procedures, interweaving peak pandemic COVID precautions into his own personal security routine. We have to observe strict quarantine for two weeks before any event. 
Even those lasting 15 to 20 minutes, Gleb said. There is a pool of employees who have been cleared, who underwent two-week quarantine. They are considered clean and can work in the same room as Putin. When asked whether the staff questioned these measures, Gleb responded that everyone was a little perplexed as to why this is still going on, because everyone has been forced to get vaccinated. Everyone undergoes health screenings, monitors their health, and takes regular tests. I know that all of the president's aides take PCR tests several times a day. I have no idea why, he's probably just worried about his health. Perhaps Putin isn't wrong to be overly cautious, with millions of people who would gladly take his life. Given the chance, there may be a method to his madness. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Putin's paranoia manifests itself not only in his behavior and his relationships, but in the places he occupies and the vehicles that move him from one place to the next. Having had to install encrypted communications on a range of non-stationary facilities ranging from planes, helicopters, trains and yachts, Gleb noted that Putin has contingency plans in place for almost every conceivable situation. One of Putin's preferred modes of transport of late is a specialized armored train, which Gleb noted appeared on his FGS schedule sometime between 2014 and 2015. The train is unremarkable at first glance, bearing the same appearance as an ordinary train, the same as all the other Russian railway trains, he said, gray with a red stripe. The front of Putin's train is what distinguishes it from any other. Its two engine cars constitute the main armored element, bulkier and beefier than traditional engines. These contain encrypted communication systems and armored plating. Putin frequently uses the train for travel, but it enables him to hide in plain sight. Planes show up on certain services and networks, whereas a train, how many of these gray trains are there? Most importantly, they cannot be tracked on any information resource. It's done for stealth purposes. Between August and September 2021, Putin began using his train far more regularly. The FGS guards had to be quarantined for two weeks prior to any journey. Putin's background as a KGB agent certainly informs his paranoia playbook. For example, he has a unique way of staving off eavesdroppers and bugs when he travels abroad. He takes a soundproof telephone booth with him everywhere he goes, ensuring he can speak with complete confidentiality. When asked about the booth, Gleb said it is bulky. It's a cube about 2.5 meters high. Inside there is a workstation and a telephone, which one can use to talk without fear of those conversations being overheard or read by foreign intelligence. On top of this, like any head of state, Putin has contingency plans in place in case an attempt is made on his life. Gleb said that on a visit to Kazakhstan, he and his team rigged up a communications array in a bunker under the Russian embassy as an added precaution. It's a kind of paranoia. You are on another state's soil, Gleb observed, questioning Putin's motives. The state is the summit's convener, providing all the security. The embassy territory itself is also guarded, another precaution to ensure the president can be whisked to a safe location in a flash. Were a nuclear exchange ever to take place, Putin would likely take shelter in his airborne bunker, a modified four-engined Ilyushin Il-86 jetliner known as the Flying Kremlin, or more colloquially, Putin's doomsday plane. The aircraft was designed during the Cold War to protect Russian leadership in a worst-case scenario. With in-air refueling capabilities, no external windows save those in the cockpit, and a modified radome, with a special communications array protruding from its fuselage, Putin's secure aerial command post is designed to withstand extreme weather and electromagnetic and nuclear blasts. The United States also has a four-plane fleet of similar aircraft, most notably, a modified Boeing 747 known as the E-4B Nightwatch, kept fueled and ready for any situation. One of the most interesting observations was how Putin likes to make it look like he is more active than he really is. Ever since the war began, the Russian president has spent more and more time locked away in his secure residences in St. Petersburg, Sochi, or Novgorod. Interestingly, each of his offices in these locations is designed to be identical, so that Putin can appear to be in one place but really work from another. There were times when I know he was in Sochi. The TV is on in the background, the news is on, and they show him conducting a meeting in Novo Agariovo. So I asked a colleague in Sochi, has he left already? No, he says, he's still here. The guy used to joke that when Putin was in Sochi, they would deliberately pretend that he was leaving. They would bring a plane, a motorcade would set off, while in actual fact, he would stay in Sochi. I mean, the guys would talk about it, almost laughing. 
This is a ruse to confuse foreign intelligence in the first place, and secondly to prevent any attempts on his life. Speaking of Putin being active or not, with all the rumors about his health decreasing over the past few years, you may be wondering about his physical shape. Here's the scoop. One of the informant's most surprising revelations has to do with Putin's physical fitness. Many have long suspected that Putin has been in bad shape. Videos showing the Russian president's unnatural arm and leg twitching and alarming facial expressions fuel the fire of speculation. Some believe he has early-onset Parkinson's disease. Others posit it as blood cancer, but Gleb cast doubts on these claims. I can tell you that I went on many business trips with him, and he went on many trips before 2020. After that, he stayed in his bunker and maybe made just one, maximum three, business trips a year. Given the fact that there have been many business trips, only one or two were cancelled because of his health. When asked to clarify, Gleb added that over a span of 13 years since 2009, just two back-to-back -back business trips were cancelled owing to illness. He is in better health than many other people of his age, he said, citing his annual medical checkups. Vladimir Putin is probably not going to die anytime soon, a dossier center analyst told a CNN reporter. Gleb spoke to Putin's work ethic. He is a hard worker, sometimes working until 2 or 3 a.m. on business trips and holding meetings abroad in the middle of the night to coincide with daytime hours in Moscow. Okay, so far we've learned a lot about the Russian dictator and his creepy little habits. So what does this lunatic actually have planned for Ukraine? Gleb confessed that while he believed Putin would do something in Ukraine, he never believed it would evolve into a full-scale war. To him, something happened. The energetic and active former head of the FSB and prime minister turned president, once involved in global affairs, suddenly shut himself off from the world in 2020, erecting all kinds of barriers, the quarantine, the information vacuum, his reality became distorted. A sane person in the 21st century who looks objectively at everything happening in the world, let alone who can predict developments, at least in the medium term, would not have allowed this war to happen, Gleb claims. His dismay that nearly all of his FGS colleagues maintained unwavering support for Putin as the war escalated is palpable in his interview. To him, average Russians will struggle to separate fact from fiction as long as they stay glued to their Russian state TVs. His own wife, he said, would never have understood how information was distorted had he not told her how different things were in reality. I don't want to think about it, but if I hadn't been an officer in the FGS, I'm horrified to admit that I might have been a Z patriot or whatever they're called, because I'd be watching TV. The excessive spending to preserve one man's lavish lifestyle private luxury getaways for oligarchs and friends of Putin's, the chronic misuse of Russian taxpayer money, it all started to get to Gleb. He devoted the final part of his exclusive interview to his FGS colleagues. He exhorted them to recognize their privileged position, to see things as they really were and speak out against Putin's war. How many nameless victims of this war are there? How many of them are children? How many more such victims are required before you stop putting up with it? What is happening now in Ukraine all this destruction, this war of aggression, terrorism, and genocide of all Ukrainian people, all this is a criminal offense. Our president has become a war criminal. You have to stop following these criminal orders. But the most important motive for him remains his family. I consider it my goal that my child does not know these horrors of war, so that the state, which interferes in every possible way in the upbringing of children, does not touch her, so that she can grow up in a calm environment and will be able to grow up as a person and realize herself. It is a dignified, noble, and honorable cause. We hope that in time, Gleb's decision to defect will be vindicated in Ukraine's assured sovereignty and the end of Putin's war as we know it. But what do you think? Will Putin's madness eventually cause him to self-destruct, or will it continue to aid him in his maniacal conquering plans? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Whichever way you assess the war in Ukraine these days, you'll probably be left wondering the same thing as everyone else. What on earth has happened to Putin's infamous air force? Fighter jets like this supersonic medium-range fighter-bomber aircraft, the Su-34, or this Su-57, a multi-role fighter capable of aerial combat as well as ground and maritime strikes, should be dominating the skies over Ukraine. But instead, they're either seen fleeing the battlefield or ungracefully falling onto the ground in flames. Try as they might, Russian combat aviators have failed to establish any kind of air superiority over the battlefield thus far. Today, we'll take a look at a few reasons why, starting with something called manpads. 
Don't be fooled by the name, these things have Putin's aircraft retreating left and right, and a quick dive into one of the most revolutionary periods in the history of military air power, the Jet Age. The coming of the Jet Age in the late 1940s ushered in profound changes in the field of aeronautics. Jets could fly faster, climb higher, and travel farther than their piston-powered predecessors, feats that would forever transform the commercial aviation industry. They would have major implications for military air power too. Jet propulsion was supposed to make air power king. If you could outrun the enemy in the skies, you could theoretically enjoy unfettered air superiority over the battlefield. At least that was the idea. Sound-shattering increases in aircraft speeds motivated designers to swap traditional guns for air-to-air -air missiles, their only hope of ever shooting a supersonic jet out of the sky. Missiles not only remain the preferred weapon for air-to-air -air combat, but revolutionize the very nature of air defense itself. Today, air defenses rely almost exclusively on surface-to-air missile systems, or SAMs, to prevent hostile air attacks. Impressively, technological advances in the 1970s made it possible to furnish vulnerable infantry with their own portable handheld anti-aircraft missiles too. Man-portable air defense systems, or MANPADs, are simple and cost-effective shoulder-fired rockets that lock onto aircraft using infrared homing. They can be taught to new users in a matter of a few minutes. Useful, right? Putin thought so too. Knowing Russia's numerically superior air force would play a central role in the opening phases of its invasion of Ukraine back in February of 2022, Western nations rushed thousands of manpads into Ukrainian hands to shore up their air defenses. These included American Stinger missiles, surplus Soviet eyeglass, and British laser-guided high-velocity Starstreak systems. The gamble paid off. Cheap manpads made it much harder for Russia's air force to establish aerial supremacy, imposing steep, asymmetrical costs on Russian pilots who could no longer safely approach priority targets in Ukrainian airspace. For the price of one $60,000 to $80,000 Igla, Ukrainian soldiers can down a $36 million Su-34 bomber or an $85 million Sukhoi Su-35S fighter. That's real bang for your buck. This has had real repercussions all over the battlefield. Modern combined arms warfare hinges on effective cooperation between all service branches air, armor, artillery, and infantry. Because Russia has thus far been unable to provide active, continuous air cover for its ground units, tanks, logistic convoys, artillery, and infantry have been repeatedly caught out in the open and destroyed over the course of the war, a spectacle played out almost daily in combat footage littering social media for the entire world to see. Here's the bad news, though. Despite Putin's failure to establish air dominance in Ukraine, this does not mean that Russian aircraft are not present over the battlefield or that Ukraine enjoys its own air superiority. Far from it. In a recent interview, Ukrainian troops on the front lines around Bakhmut told reporters that Russian aircraft still fly over the battlefield almost every day, sometimes a few times each day, but manpads have drastically reduced the extent to which they can linger over their targets. Here's how it usually goes down. Most overflights last only a few seconds. Fighter bombers flying in pairs or groups of four ingress to a target area at low altitude, maybe 50 meters or less, and then lob rockets and bank left or right and return back to base. Rather than hover over the front, far slower helicopters tend to operate similarly as airborne artillery platforms, approaching the contact line, firing their salvos of unguided rockets, and departing as quickly as possible. This has made it even harder for Ukrainian infantry to shoot down Russian aircraft. Constant vigilance is required since little warning is given. One soldier provided insight into the process. When the infantry shouts, incoming, and hides in the trenches, you have to run out and try to find the enemy's plane or aircraft. It doesn't matter if the enemy is shelling you or if it's calm. Your response has to be highly focused, and you have to have perfect sight and hearing to find a target at a distance of three to five kilometers. From the moment you've heard the sound, you literally have three to five seconds to run up and throw the man pads on your shoulder. Since timing is everything, concealed Ukrainians tend to target slower Su-20 fighter bombers and helicopters like the Mi-8. Hefting an 18kg Igler onto your shoulder while sprinting out to the open and get a lock while the target zips overhead, then launching the missile knowing you're in mortal danger all within a span of 15 seconds or less, can you imagine how difficult that must be? The decentralization of air defense made possible by man pads like the Stinger has helped limit the effectiveness of Russian air power, but it hasn't blunted it altogether. According to former Staff Sergeant and Green Beret David Bramlett, 
a combat veteran who recently spent 11 months fighting the Russians in Ukraine, Russia could still turn things around if Western support wavers. Let's hope that doesn't happen, but even if it does, there's a chance Putin will take care of his air army's downfall all by himself. You see, lucky for Ukraine, Russia also has its own incompetence to thank in part for its lack of air superiority. Recently, accidents have taken their toll on Russian aircraft, with six crashes alone registered over the span of two months in late 2022. In September, a Russian Air Force Su-25 attack aircraft crashed just after takeoff after entering a left turn. Experts believe the crash was likely due to a technical fault or a pilot error. The pilot did not eject. A month later, an Su-25 fighter bomber careened into the courtyard of an apartment building in Yesk, a western port on the Sea of Azov, during a training flight after its pilot ejected. The devastating crash injured 25 and killed at least 15 civilians, three of them children. According to Russian state media, the accident was caused by an engine fire sustained during takeoff. Just a week later, another Su-30 fighter entered a vertical dive and smashed into a two-story residential home in Siberia, killing its two pilots in a fiery explosion. It was the second such fatal incident in six days involving a Sukhoi fighter plane. No civilians were killed. But the crashes don't end there, and they are happening on a wider scale than you may know. The avalanche of accidents reflects the toll the war has had on Russian aviation writ large. Reflecting on the aerial crashes, Michael Bonnet, an engineer and analyst at Rand Corporation, noted that what's interesting is that even aircraft not involved in the Russian invasion are crashing. In an interview with Business Insider, he said that while mechanical failures are expected in aircraft over time, a rapid increase in fleet-wide mechanical failures may indicate that something fundamental has changed. So what has changed? The war has placed immeasurable strain on Russian aviation. Colossal losses contributed to Russia's tendency to adopt more risk-averse tactics, playing a subordinate role to Russia's ground troops, according to Guy Plopsky, an Israeli defense analyst and Russian expert. In just eight months, Russian combat aviators flew on average 150 sorties a day for a total of 34,000 combat sorties, but the number of sorties has greatly diminished. From an early high of 300 per day, Britain's Ministry of Defense estimates that now Russia probably conducts tens of missions per day. Very few of those sorties actually enter Ukrainian airspace. General wear and tear can be expected in any war, but the immense toll has seriously impacted Russia's pool of 7,500 relatively inexperienced pilots, who are said to receive roughly 100 hours of flight time per year, one-third less than their NATO counterparts. The lack of training limits their ability to conduct the type of massive air campaigns Western armies almost take for granted. According to Justin Bronk, an air power analyst, since Russian pilots are trained almost exclusively to fly in pairs and have little exposure to larger exercises, get relatively few flying hours compared to most NATO fighter crews, do not have support from tankers on most operations, and are not doctrinally trained for large air campaigns, it is perhaps unsurprising in retrospect that the Russian Aerospace Forces VKS, proved incapable of conducting a Western-style war against Ukraine. Of a pool of around 300 modernized and 400 other frontline jets, Russia has sustained 72 air losses during the war, each costing tens of millions of dollars. The losses also include pilots, which are difficult to train and even more difficult to replace. Just ask Britain's RAF, itself suffering from a shortage of trained air crews, where it most recently had more F-35 Lightning II fighters than it had pilots amid a five-year waiting list for students to reach the front line. But the lack of qualified pilots is only one part of the problem. Russia also lacks skilled mechanics or the proper tools to make and fix the parts needed to keep Russia's modernized air fleet up to snuff. The fact that its pre-war stockpiles are dilapidated and rapidly diminishing only adds to the problems as the demand for specialized parts and repair tools grows. Russia has tried to mobilize greater amounts of manpower to address the human part of the problem, which, as you can imagine, has its own issues. Just like training pilots, you have to train the repair crews to diagnose and maintain extremely complex computer avionics and technical systems. That is, if you can get them. Herein lies another problem with Russia's Air Force. While mobilization certainly affected the small and medium-sized companies that make aviation parts, the random crashes and accidents began happening prior to mobilization. The shortage of manufacturing tools was already going on, which means Western sanctions may have had a role to play. 
Russia has been left in an economic and industrial vice by the West, squeezed out of its many traditional import-export markets where it has received the critical components it needs to keep its airplanes airworthy. Modern aircraft are outfitted with a deeply complex array of electronic systems. Computer targeting, special sights, communication relays, everything relies on critical electronic components previously available to Russia only on the import market. Moscow has previously admitted that it was 15 years behind the rest of the world, producing its own semiconductors, which isn't a good look when so many of today's precision weapons heavily rely on them. Russian manufacturers are now trying to source the components they need on the black market, but in the interim, Western sanctions and embargoes have forced the Kremlin to crack open stocks of its Soviet-era dumb munitions that lack computer guidance. Cannibalizing older pieces of equipment for spare parts is one way to try and stem the tide of aircraft losses, but it's hardly a good one. The result is an ad hoc, hodgepodge approach to combat aviation, hardly a combination any pilot anywhere should ever want to try. Some cases are pretty bad. It's reported that Russian pilots have been forced to tape commercial GPS devices to their cockpits for navigation, one report claimed. There are reports of Russian aircrews being so incompetent they leave the covers on aircraft sensors before takeoff. Another outlet claims their bombing accuracy has a mere 40% success rate compared to the pinpoint precision displayed by Western coalition forces during the campaigns in Syria and Iraq. We don't know exactly how effective Western sanctions have been in dulling Russian air power, but it has certainly played a role in suffocating access to the parts it needs to operate at the top of its game. In a war, every little bit of help goes a long way. There's no out-and-out -out answer as to why Putin has failed to establish air superiority. It is likely that a combination of factors – wear and tear, stress on older airframes, a lack of pilots and trained aircrews, and Western sanctions – have each played a significant role. What we do know is that thanks in part to their own outstanding courage, adaptability and resilience coupled with the material support they've received from the West, Ukraine has managed to do a lot with a little in terms of its own air defense. Talks are still ongoing over the feasibility of supplying Ukrainian aviators with Western fighter aircraft. If this were to happen, we shouldn't expect much to change anytime soon. Much like the implementation of Western main battle tanks, it will take months, if not years, to furnish Ukrainian aviators with the tools they need to become truly proficient on unfamiliar systems like the F-16, the Eurofighter Typhoon, the Assault Mirage and other planes. That said, we should never again underestimate the pluck of Ukrainian service members who have a penchant for proving us wrong. Why do you think Russian air power is failing? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Putin's invasion of Ukraine is a disaster, and it's no wonder. The man is a paranoid megalomaniac who goes around poisoning his opposition's underpants, uses outdated Soviet-era weapons and tactics on the battlefield, and isolates himself from the world to a degree that is clearly eating away at his sanity. And that's not all. If you haven't heard this before, we're here to talk about it today. Putin is a thief. While there are numerous military mistakes that Russian generals and armies have made, the mistakes begin at the top with Putin himself. No surprise there, right? But you may be surprised at just how vast and crazy this sea of mistakes, dirty little secrets and even just basic stupidity really is. Here's the scoop. You can tell how big a thief Vladimir Putin is by how many articles and documentaries have been made about how he's stolen Russia blind. One pertinent article is literally titled just that, Stealing Russia Blind. Written by Harley Balzer and published in the Journal of Democracy, in the article, Balzer points out that Putin has established a sistema, the Russian word for an established and accepted system, based on massive predation that has produced the most unequal wealth distribution in any developed economy. Estimates have suggested that Putin and his oligarch cronies have stolen more than a trillion dollars worth from the Russian economy since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. But that is just the beginning of Putin's kleptocracy story. Putin's experience with government-level theft started early, long before he reached Russia's throne, when he managed to steal $124 million worth of funding that was designed to feed the starving population of St. Petersburg in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. In 1996, he was able to protect his boss, St. Petersburg Mayor Anatoly Sobchak, when Sobchak lost an election over a corruption scandal and fled the country, an escape arranged by Putin himself. That ability to protect his corrupt friends is what garnered attention by the equally corrupt Russian President Boris Yeltsin in 1999, who was leaving office during an investigation into his own massive corruption. 
Estimates by four different worldwide organizations of the level of endemic corruption in Russia suggested that at a minimum, $30 billion a year was being stolen from the Russian economy. That amounts to 10 to 12 percent of the national GDP. And that was just what the investigators could prove. Eventually, those losses cost his country dearly. Money that should have gone to train soldiers, to modernize equipment, to keep planes flying and tanks in working order, to simply fill up their gas tanks. All this had been stolen from Russia's military. That higher figure of $1 trillion worth of theft was mentioned again by investigator Bill Browder, who also suggested that Putin's net worth alone is in excess of $200 billion. These funds could have also gone to better roads, better health care, and better everything in Russia, not just a better military. But it's the kleptocracy rampant in Russia's military that the invasion of Ukraine has brought front and center. Russia has been undergoing a much vaunted modernization effort that's been ongoing since 2008, but these efforts have failed to root out Putin's personally embedded sistema, which is present in all levels of Russia's military. The army's infantry commanders frequently inflate the number of active personnel in their units, and from the excess, those commanders steal the surplus funds for themselves. The accounting is continually plagued by falsified numbers of both men and material, which leads to false appraisal of the unit's true combat capability. But the units are not only plagued by missing soldiers and supplies, their lower-level commanders and sometimes the soldiers themselves have sold available gear and even their own vehicles gasoline for money or traded them for alcohol. All branches of the armed forces generally have unreliable and opaque reporting up and down the command chain, which has led Russia's leadership to believe its forces were better, quantitatively and qualitatively, than they really were at the start of the invasion. And with the lack of available gear for their newly mobilized troops, some soldiers or their families have had to resort to buying their own weapons, their own bulletproof gear, and sometimes even their uniforms. That's just… sad. And weird. And it's about to get weirder. Putin is personally responsible for the three segments that underpin his rule as an autocrat. He perpetuates his rule by maintaining absolute secrecy. He isolates himself from reality by listening to only a very select few advisors. And he surrounded himself with yes-men whose only redeeming quality is their unwavering loyalty. Since the beginning of the invasion in February of 2022, Moscow has, if anything, doubled down on silencing frank discussion of the conflict even going so far as to criminalize assessments of combat deaths and forecasts about how the war might unfold. Criticism of the war, it's still technically a crime to call Putin's special operation a war, though some media darlings have finally used that term, remains completely off-limits, including discussion of military incompetence and the absence of accountability that has led to the military's serious problems inside of Ukraine. This censorship makes it hard for the military elite to get accurate information on what's going wrong in the war, which in turn hampers their efforts to correct their mistakes. Meanwhile, the level of secrecy that Putin has made an intractable part of the Russian sistema was one of the biggest reasons for the early failure of the invasion. The self-defeating deception caused by Putin's decision to prioritize operational secrecy and domestic blindness to the impending war led to a notable lack of adequate planning. Pre-invasion secrecy led to avoidable problems that specifically affected the initial application of Russian air power. Russian pilots had gained some experience fighting air battles in Syria, but operations there had taken place over mostly uncontested desert terrain, where enemy opposition could be spotted and dealt with long before it became an actual threat. Russian pilots had almost no experience fighting over a forested country like Ukraine, a much more defensible and far larger area than the rebel-held enclaves in Syria. These pilots also hadn't trained against an opponent with any kind of layered air defenses and numerous manned portable air defense systems or man pads that Ukraine possessed. Russian pilots were given little to no training in such tactics before the invasion. That unpreparedness is partly why Russia has been unable to establish air superiority over the Ukrainian battlefield, and why they've met with such heavy losses in the air. Another factor in the failure of the air assets was how Russia decided to employ their forces. Because their ground troops were in grave danger within days of the invasion, the Russian Air Force had its primary objective switched from suppressing air defenses to providing close air support, which in turn brought them into greater danger from the numerous Western-supplied manpad systems. These missions forced Russian pilots to engage targets at low altitudes, which placed them well within the range of cheap and numerous anti-air missiles, like the US-made Stinger. After the first few months of this, Russia found itself not just suffering unacceptable losses of expensive aircraft and helicopters, 
but also significant drain of their trained pilots and aircrew, which take months or years worth of training to replace. And while all this is going on, Putin remains in his creepy little cave of isolation and delusions of grandeur. Not only is Putin's insistence on secrecy a major problem, but he has insulated himself from the reality of the world by relying on just a handful of advisors. By orchestrating the invasion with just a handful of military advisors, many of whom earned their positions not by being good strategists, but by being loyal to a fault, Putin created a plan that had no basis in reality. For example, the primary invasion thrust south from Belarus toward Kyiv brought only enough rations for the troops and fuel for their vehicles to last two to three days. The level to which Putin and his advisors were out of touch with reality was displayed by the troops who carried with them dress uniforms for their expected victory parade in the middle of the capital. Putin's invasion plan was filled with faulty assumptions, arbitrary political goals, and planning mistakes that ignored key Russian military principles. The initial invasion called for multiple unsupported lines of attack with no reserve forces, tying the military to far-flung objectives that were unattainable for the modest size of its ground forces. Due to such isolation, Putin erroneously believed that his war plans were sound, that Ukraine would not put up much resistance, and that US and NATO support would not be strong enough or arrive fast enough to make a difference. The invasion plan reinforced in Putin's mind by his sycophantic comrades painted a picture of the valiant Russian army riding unchallenged into the territory of Ukraine. The brotherly Ukrainians would welcome them with open arms and would thank them for rescuing all of Ukraine from their neo-Nazi and corrupt drug-addicted leadership. The overmatched Ukrainian forces would run at the first sight of overwhelming Russian forces. After Kyiv fell within three days, the liberators would then receive a warm greeting in the southern and eastern regions of the country. The Russian elder brothers would then install a properly subservient government in Kyiv that would gratefully accommodate any demands Putin placed upon them. It came as quite a shock then, when Russia's troops, which along with its direct leadership had no inkling that they were going to be an invading army, and ran headlong into a fierce and unified Ukrainian resistance, supported by unexpected amounts of advanced Western weaponry and accurate satellite-supported intelligence. The three-pronged invasion suffered far more casualties than they either expected or could cope with. According to Russian doctrine, any major-level war, such as the Ukraine invasion, should have begun with weeks of air and missile attacks targeting an enemy's military installations and critical infrastructure. Russia's planners consider this the decisive period of warfare, with air force operations and missile strikes lasting between four and six weeks, designed to erode the opposing country's military capabilities and capacity to resist. According to Russia's military doctrine, ground forces are typically deployed to secure objectives only after massive artillery bombardments combined with air force and missile assaults have weakened or destroyed most of the opposition. But Putin's delusions aren't the only issue in the Ukraine war. When you have a leader who's lost touch with reality, and a whole crowd of people cheering all hail the emperor's new clothes, your kingdom is pretty much doomed. General George S. Patton used to say, if everybody is thinking alike then somebody isn't thinking. Patton was always keenly aware that yes men, those who only tell their bosses what the boss wants to hear, aren't helpful at all, but only reinforce what the boss is already thinking. In 2022, one of Putin's most significant intelligence figures defected to the West, carrying with him a trove of important information about Putin the man, detailing his habits, his fears, and his reluctance to use any cell phones. Gleb Karakulov, who served in the Federal Protection Service FSO, a quasi-military force tasked with protecting those officials closest to Putin, described Putin as a president who has lost touch with the world. Putin has been living in an information cocoon for the past couple of years, spending most of his time in his residences, which the media very fittingly calls bunkers. He is pathologically afraid for his life, he surrounds himself with an impenetrable barrier of quarantines and an information vacuum, he only values his own life and the lives of his family and friends. Karakulov also shed light on Putin's inner circle. Putin requires all staff working in the same room as him and anyone who will appear close to him in photo ops to undergo a two-week quarantine which severely limits the number of people who have personal access to him. Karakulov confirmed that Putin relies heavily for information on reports provided by the chiefs of his security services. Putin does not use a cell phone or the internet and does not even bring an internet specialist with him when he travels abroad. He only receives information from his closest circle, which means that he lives in an information vacuum, Karakulov said. 
Ok, so we've established Putin is pretty much running his own operation into the ground. But this isn't the only reason Russia is failing in the Russo-Ukraine war. Let's talk about Russia's abysmal logistics for a second. The famous quote, amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics, has been credited to everyone from Napoleon to US General Omar Bradley. But the first recorded use of that phrase in that form was by a retired four-star marine general named Robert Hilliard Barrow. He was speaking about the difference between localized maneuvers that could win a battle and overall army supply coordination that could win or lose a war. Russia's invasion of Ukraine was plagued by logistical nightmares from the very beginning. Ukraine knew they could depend on their home-designed Skiff or Stuna P anti-tank guided missile ATGM systems, but they also knew they'd be facing 2,000 or more Russian main battle tanks, plus more than twice that number of armored infantry fighting vehicles IFVs. Knowing that Ukraine needed help against these armored forces, the US and its allies managed to deliver more than 17,000 anti-tank missile systems to Ukraine within the first month of the war, including the Anglo-Swedish short-range in-law rocket and the even more powerful US-made Javelin ATGM. Ukraine was also supplied with Bayraktar TB2 drones from Turkey. Ukraine used these weapon systems not just against Russia's armored forces, but also against even more valuable targets, their fuel and ammunition vehicles. Without resupplies of ammunition, their tanks and even their infantry had to resort to more limited attacks, and without fuel some of their armored columns ground to a halt completely. Most famous, the 40-mile-long armored column that struck south from Belarus toward Kyiv in the opening days of the war was stalled due to a combination of stiff Ukrainian resistance, primarily ambushes from either side of the narrow penetration, combined with successful targeting of Russia's ammo and fuel trucks by both anti-tank missiles and targeted drone attacks. Military analysts who have analyzed the early months of the war have come to the conclusion that Russia completely botched its initial invasion for a variety of reasons and that its campaign has been riddled with miscalculations, poor communication, and widespread confusion. Former CIA military analyst Jeffrey Edmonds, who is also a Russia expert at the Center for Naval Analyses, says in a recent interview, we would have thought that they would have done a much more deliberate, well thought through operation. That is not what they did. Russian warfare usually involved masses of artillery pounding enemy locations, followed by massed armor and mechanized infantry assaults, combined with air support and helicopter attacks. Instead of leading with a substantial air and artillery campaign and gaining strategic superiority over Ukraine, Russian commanders apparently instructed their troops to just drive to Kyiv. The units quickly faced unexpected ambushes repeated tactical surprise, and a logistic supply train that had not anticipated anything beyond a half-week offensive. The 40-mile traffic jam north of Kyiv underscored another recurring problem with Russian logistics. They are dependent on rail lines to move troops and support gear around their own country, but cannot link those rail lines up with their offensive advances into Ukraine. That leaves a gap between Russia's end-of-the-line ammo and fuel dumps and the Ukrainian front lines. One solution Russian commanders used to reduce that gap, and the length of time it would take to resupply forward units, was placing their supply dumps closer to the front lines. That decision turned disastrous when the US began providing Ukraine with better artillery systems, including the M142 High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, or HIMARS, with its pinpoint accuracy out to 50 miles, twice the range of the M777 howitzer Ukraine had previously been using with its 25-mile range. But Russian commanders failed to respect the accuracy and range of HIMARS systems and continually lost weapon storage depots over and over again. Too often, Russia placed their ammunition in the same building as their troops or close by to such a location. That proved disastrous on at least one occasion, when Ukraine struck an occupied school building in Makiivka in the Donetsk region on New Year's Eve, killing as many as 400 Russian soldiers and wounding another 300, according to Ukraine claims. Another persistent problem in Russia's logistics fiasco has been the reliance on unsecured phone lines. This has allowed Ukrainian intelligence to triangulate their position and strike them with highly accurate artillery and missile strikes. One such attack reportedly left hundreds of Russian soldiers dead and prompted the Russian Ministry of Defense to announce it is already clear that the main reason of what took place included the massive use, contrary to the ban, of personal mobile phones in the range of enemy weapons. Yet such use persists, both from the average trooper to the high command. The Russian news agency TASS suggested that the New Year's Eve attack was also due to soldiers' misuse of civilian cell phones. 
Preliminarily, the reason for the strike was the active use of mobile phones by the newly arrived military personnel. The enemy revealed the activity of cellular communications and the location of the subscribers, which allowed them to target the temporary barracks. And then there's Russia's mass misjudgment of NATO's united front. Putin and his tiny handful of advisors also miscalculated the stiffness of NATO's resolve to defend Ukraine, as well as their willingness to arm them with every weapon system they could. Putin believed the individual countries of NATO, led by the US, Germany, France, Great Britain, and Poland, would each go their separate ways and would fail to provide a united front against what Putin expected would be a short blitzkrieg-type war. Instead, his brutal invasion solidified NATO's unity and even helped convince new countries like Finland and Sweden to ask for membership. Finland's admission, making NATO's 31st member, was an especially bitter pill to swallow as it increased NATO's border presence with Russia by an extra 830 miles. This was clearly one of Putin's most significant blunders. The US, NATO, and the European Union have remained relatively united in providing billions of military aid to Ukraine as well as considerable humanitarian assistance, while simultaneously applying sweeping sanctions against Russia. The sanctions have crippled the Russian economy, which took an extra hit from the loss of between 700,000 and 1 million young Russians who fled the country ahead of Putin's draft in the fall of 2022. The Russian population pyramid, already in an upside-down position with a declining birth rate and far more older citizens than young ones to replace them, is now teetering like a half-chopped-down tree ready to collapse at any moment. Now let's get into the truly ridiculous part of our analysis of Putin's failures as a war commander, fighting a modern war using World War I tactics. By the end of the first year of the war, it became clear that in addition to all the strategic and leadership mistakes Putin and Russia have committed, there's a vast difference in how the two armies are fighting it out on the ground. While Ukraine has relied heavily on smart weapons, surveillance and attack drones, ATGMs, man pads, precision guided munitions, even drone attack boats in the Black Sea, Russia has settled on the World War I tactic of massed artillery, followed by human waves of soldiers, often without even the benefit of a few tanks sprinkled in here and there for support. Such tactics may have worked in World War I or even the latter stages of World War II, when the former Soviet Union had more than a million men under arms and was facing a severely weakened German army that had bled white from four years of continuous warfare. But Ukraine has learned to adapt and overcome and has used its precision artillery systems, especially the High Mars artillery, to telling effect. Meanwhile, Russia has used their huge surplus of artillery to flatten cities like Bakhmut, Mariinka, and Mariupol. But the massed infantry assaults that followed leveled a horrific toll on the attackers. Estimates are that in addition to losing more than half of their pre-war stockpile of main battle tanks, Russia has lost more than 200,000 soldiers killed, wounded, or captured. Their losses in the 10-month effort to take Bakhmut have been so enormous that the Wagner private mercenary group that spearheaded the 10-month battle had to pull out of the line of combat to refit, retrain, and regroup. Some estimates say that Wagner may have lost 90% of their 80,000-man full strength. Wagner's leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, will only admit to having lost 20,000 men, which is still a staggeringly high number of casualties for a city that has no inherent strategic value. While we're on the subject of losses, let's talk about the real crime and tragedy of this war. Because of the sanctions limiting Russia's access to computer chips and other resources for their high-tech industries, Russia has been unable to replace many of their advanced weapons, such as their precision munitions and state-of-the-art missiles. That's why analysts are stunned to see Putin wasting so much of its stockpiles of precision munitions on striking civilian targets. Military experts and government officials have said that Putin's terror campaign against the Ukrainian population was not a sustainable use of Russia's limited stockpiles and was unlikely to negatively affect Ukraine's will to fight. In fact, just the opposite has happened. Continued explosions in civilian areas across Ukraine, not just the capital of Kyiv, have hardened the average Ukrainian's resolve to see this fight through until every Russian soldier has been pushed out of their country. More recently, senior US intelligence officials have said Russia is burning through its munitions faster than it can replace them. Officials also say the use of massive amounts of artillery and precision-guided munitions has forced Moscow to turn to Iran and North Korea for supplies. Retired U.S. Army General David Petraeus summed up just a few of the mistakes Putin has made during his invasion of Ukraine when he said, They completely underestimated the Ukrainian forces. 
and completely overestimated the Russian forces, and they could not impose their line of conducting a military campaign and prepare forces for conducting this campaign. In addition, they did not have modern telecommunication systems, he said, referring to their use of civilian cell phones. Therefore, the generals continued to die, commanding an army from within an intelligence vacuum, relying on sycophants and toadies rather than experts and veterans. An army sent to war without proper planning, hamstrung by poor logistics, and saddled with rampant thievery, underestimating your opponent's will to fight, misjudging NATO's united front, squandering sophisticated precision weapons on a campaign to try to break the will of a large civilian population, youth movement to leave the country, possibly for good, an economy that has been wrecked by sanctions that continue to penalize the ones who are still left day after day. It seems like Putin not only did not follow Sun Tzu's dictum to win your battles by making no mistakes, it seems like he's made practically every mistake in the book. But what do you think? What is Putin's greatest mistake in the war in Ukraine? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Imagine that it's the year 2030. NATO forces operating somewhere near the Baltic coastline have come across a truly frightening sight. The Russian forces on the opposite end of no man's land are outfitted in body armor, which makes them look like a unit of robocops. Their faces are covered with an intimidating helmet and visor that gives them an edge in the information domain. Their chests and all of their extremities are protected by overlapping bullet-resistant plates. To make matters worse, their armor also has an integrated exoskeleton that increases their strength, speed, and endurance. The protective power of their armor is also unparalleled. Even 50 caliber Browning machine gun rounds don't have enough stopping power to put these guys down. What's a NATO unit to do in the face of such fearsome enemies? Well, not much, because this scenario is likely to be as imaginary as anything that Hollywood can produce. Meet the Sotnik, Russia's next-generation body armor that worried defense officials and military experts when it was unveiled. If it works as advertised, there is reason indeed to be worried, but it probably won't. And there is a long history of Russian body armor failures to believe that it won't. Before Russia invaded Ukraine, defense and foreign policy analysts regarded its military as the second most capable fighting force in the world. It had demonstrated its post-Soviet prowess with experience in Chechnya in the 1990s and 2000s, Georgia in 2008, and Ukraine in 2014, when it rapidly secured control of Crimea. It was also a fearsome military. Experts remembered the devastation the Russian Air Force and artillery units had brought to the Chechen city of Grozny during multiple battles in the 1990s. Aside from the Kremlin building a formidable artillery-based land force that would be resilient against air attacks, experts also touted Russia's new, technologically advanced weapon systems. These platforms included the new fifth-generation Su-57 fighter jet and the T-14 Armata main battle tank, which was supposedly more advanced than any other tank in foreign arsenals. However, when Russia launched the invasion, these theories quickly got tossed to the winds. The supposedly fearsome Russian war machine proved hard-pressed to supply itself over even short distances. The T-14 and Su-57 were almost nowhere to be seen, and Russian soldiers found themselves bogged down in a costly war of attrition, suffering from poor command doctrine and Western weapons like the Javelin and HIMARS, which proved so devastating to their supposedly latest and greatest gear. Even the venerable Patriot air defense system, which first came online in the 1980s, was able to knock one of Russia's ultra-modern Kinzhal hypersonic missiles, which Vladimir Putin had once touted as invincible, out of the sky. Now the Russian military is boasting about its next-generation body armor, the Sotnik. If it delivers as promised, it will protect its wearer better than any other body armor system in the world, but like most Russian boasting, there's a lot of hype about the Sotnik and not a whole lot of facts. Since 2016, Russian troops have worn the Ratnik 2 body armor system, accompanied by the 6B45 helmet. The Ratnik's vest has an effective area protection that is larger than most other body-comparable armor systems. Based on a material similar to Kevlar, the Ratnik covers 90% of a soldier's body, and its granite ceramic plates can withstand 10 sniper rifle shots from a distance of only 10 meters. It is a good system to protect against shrapnel and explosive fragments too. The Ratnik's overalls protect the entire body from these flying pieces of metal and other debris. Ratnik 2 takes care to protect the groin and extremities like the hands, 
The 6B45 helmet, meanwhile, covers an area of 30 square decimeters with effective protection. Despite this, the helmet remains light at only 1 kilogram, which means that Russian military personnel can attach various instruments to it without adding undue strain on their necks. Such equipment includes thermal and night vision monoculars, flashlights, and a communication system with specialized headphones. Perhaps most impressively, the Ratnik 2 body armor has an electromagnetic camouflage system that shields its wearer from infrared sensors. The armor weighs between 40 and 50 pounds, but some of the weight is relieved by a passive carbon fiber exoskeleton. The exoskeleton also protects its wearer's spine and joints from the gradual wear and tear that lugging around such heavy weight will do to a person over time. This exoskeleton does not need an external power source to function. Ratnik is supposed to be getting an upgrade too. In 2020, Russia announced it would be developing its Ratnik 3 body armor system. This version would include an integrated exoskeleton, a helmet visor-mounted target designation system, stealth fabric, anti-mine boots, a vision system via electric goggles that would allow soldiers to link up with the camera views of small drones and see tactical orders or maps of the broader area, and an anti-thermal and anti-radar camouflage suit. The integrated exoskeleton for the Ratnik 3 was getting an upgrade as well. It was reportedly designed to comfortably haul weights of up to 132 pounds during combat operations. In 2021, American military planners were nervous about these developments. There was the feeling that the United States was lagging behind on body armor and exoskeleton systems for its soldiers and Marines. The revelation of Sotnik made American defense officials and think tanks even more nervous. Now they know better. Unfortunately for Russia, much of the hype about the Ratnik was a bunch of boasts, as we've come to expect by now. In 2017, the Russian army said it had received 200,000 sets of Ratnik 2 body armor. The following year, the Russian Ministry of Defense said it expected that all of its military personnel would be equipped with the Ratnik 2 by 2020. But 2020 came and went, and the Russian military failed in its goal. The invasion of Ukraine proved as such. Instead of getting standard-issue gear, Russian troops fighting in Ukraine, even those in the regular army at the start of the invasion, have had to make do with what body armor they could get. Most of the Ratnik's claims failed to materialize on the battlefield. Complaints about body armor and helmet malfunction have been frequent in the Russian ranks throughout the course of the war. Instead of the new Ratnik, some of the luckier Russian troops have been seen wearing older 6B23 body armor in Ukraine. This armor can be protective against indirect impacts like shrapnel or shell fragments, but lacks the ability to adequately defend its wearer from direct ballistic hits. Even if the enemy gunshots fail to penetrate the 6B23, the armor cannot easily disperse the energy the impacting bullets transfer to the human body. Broken bones and internal trauma were frequently reported among those who wore 6B23 body armor and suffered combat-related injuries. These shortcomings are what prompted the Kremlin to replace the 6B23 with the Ratnik family of armors in the first place. However, complete Ratnik armors were few and far between on the battlefields of Ukraine. What happened? Typical corruption within the Russian military's ranks has proven part of its body armor failures. In 2021, a Russian captain and ensign were convicted of stealing 56 sets of body armor and selling them online. The captain got a sentence of six years and the ensign got seven years. Both of them are currently serving time in a penal colony. These two may have been made an example of, but they were hardly the only ones. It's common for officers in the Russian military to sell off top-of-the-line gear to line their own pockets, and then issue Cold War-era equipment to the soldiers under their command instead. The Russian military's body armor problems got much worse when Vladimir Putin announced partial mobilization in the fall of 2022, as Ukraine was pushing his forces back in Kharkiv and Kherson, and he desperately needed additional manpower. According to defense intelligence officials in the UK, the conscripts Russia mobilized in late 2022 often had no choice but to buy their own body armor because Russian armories were short. Many of the armor kits that these people and their families wound up buying turned out to be fake too. Those lucky enough to get their hands on real Ratnik armor often wound up becoming victims of theft, as poorly equipped Russian regular troops at the front simply stole it from them. The demand led to a boom in the price of any kind of body armor that even looked real on Russian e-commerce sites. Body armor, and we use that term loosely in this context, can now fetch up to $650 a piece online in Russia. This is a price that most of the soldiers in Ukraine and their families cannot afford, 
especially because a disproportionate amount of the people conscripted to fight in the autumn of 2022 came from Russia's poorer ethnic minority communities. Ukrainian soldiers who have captured body armor worn by Russian soldiers on the battlefield have often found such gear fitted with cheap steel plates instead of the high-tech ceramics, which are now designed to slow the bullet down to reduce its impacting force. The ceramic plates in high-quality body armor like the American Interceptor also fracture and deform the bullet itself as it impacts the vest. This fracturing and deforming in turn distributes the bullet's energy over a wider area to protect the wearer against blunt force trauma. While some armies use steel instead of ceramics in their body armor, this steel is extremely tensile and specially manufactured to stand up to small arms ballistics. The captured steel plates in Ukraine, though, have proven little match for small arms fire. Standard 9mm parabellum rounds were shown to puncture the steel plates on videos posted to social media by Ukrainian soldiers. Rifle rounds easily did the job. They are little more than steel sheets stolen from somewhere else and fitted into what was supposed to be body armor. Captured Russian body armor also seemed to be little more than a cloth covering to hold the faulty steel plates in place. This is in contrast to Western body armor, which is made from Kevlar and other fabrics engineered to be resistant to small arms fire and shrapnel or explosive fragments. The Russian armor, meanwhile, seemed like it would only be good against fragments or shrapnel in the area that the plates directly covered. Indeed, Ukrainian troops have been seen on video bending the steel plates in captured Russian body armor with their hands, feet, and over their knees. They laugh contemptuously as they do so. This equipment is probably not official Ratnik armor, but rather knockoffs sold on Russian e-commerce sites. However, one Russian conscript even complained on video that he was given a vest that would only be effective against an airsoft gun. It turns out that the Russian logistics brass opted to buy the toy replicas of Ratnik armor for their mobilized soldiers and pocketed the rest of the money allocated to them. Even if Russian soldiers or conscripts are lucky enough to get their hands on legitimate Ratnik armor, it is often not a complete kit. Corruption is so widespread in the Russian military that the ceramic plates inside the Ratnik vests are often missing, either to cut costs or because they are valuable commodities to sell off in their own right. Corrupt Russian logistics officers instead sold off the ceramics and replaced them with the cheap, non-ballistic steel plates that Ukrainian soldiers made fun of in the videos. The lack of effective body armor in Ukraine has proven devastating for the Russian war effort. At the end of August 2023, the Pentagon released estimates which painted a grim picture for the Russians. According to the US military, total Russian casualties over the 18-month war were approaching the 300,000 mark. This total included about 120,000 dead and 170 to 180,000 combat-related injuries. Ukraine, meanwhile, was suffering too, with 70,000 KIA and between 100 and 120,000 wounded. However, the Russians outnumber the Ukrainians by nearly 3 to 1 on the battlefields of Ukraine. There are many reasons for this disparity in casualties despite Russia's manpower advantage, but the lack of proper body armor is a big one. The Russian body armor industry is in such a poor state that the military is now turning to Chinese equipment to make up for its shortcomings. China has been reluctant to provide military aid to Russia for fear of Western sanctions, but some Chinese firms have been supplying their beleaguered strategic partner with weapons and equipment through backdoor means. Such aid includes body armor. 12 tons worth of Chinese body armor were routed to Russia through Turkey in late 2022. The body armor came from companies such as Xingxing Guangzhou Import and Export Company. Chinese companies have also sent component parts to Russian body armor manufacturers like Klass, although it's not currently understood how widespread the Klass vests have been used in Ukraine. Ukrainian soldiers have captured Klass vests on the battlefield too, although it's also unclear if these contain Chinese component parts. Ukrainian troops have been known to sell these captured materials online. Chinese body armor has been tested by American defense officials. This type of body armor uses aramid fibers, which are the same kind of fibers found in the familiar Kevlar vests used in the United States and other Western militaries. In the tests, the Chinese body armor's ceramic plates succeeded in stopping standard small arms fire, such as the 7.62 mm round, from penetrating. However, the plates showed significant deformation. The deformation indicates that soldiers wearing this armor would suffer from blunt force trauma if struck by enemy fire because the energy would not be dispersed over a wide enough area. 
If Russian troops are looking to this equipment to save them, they will probably wind up being disappointed. So as with many other aspects of its military, Russian body armor looks great on parade grounds and in the Kremlin's information networks. On the battlefield, not so much, and the results in Ukraine show it. For Russia, anything that can go wrong does seem to go wrong, thanks to institutional incompetence on every conceivable level. Now Russia has plans for its next generation body armor, the Sotnik system, which the Kremlin says will come online in 2025, replacing the Ratnik family of armors. The armor was unveiled in early 2021, about a year before the invasion of Ukraine. The armor developed by Russia's state Rostec Corporation would be the most advanced and protective body armor in the world, if it works as advertised. But what have we come to learn about Russia's military's claims by now? According to Rostec, the Sotnik armor would be capable of protecting its wearer against small arms fire and even a direct hit from the 50 caliber Browning machine gun round, which can pierce lightly armored vehicles at a range of 2 kilometers. To protect against the shock of incoming rounds like the .50 BMG, which can transfer more than enough energy to kill, even if the bullet does not penetrate the body, the Sotnik armor will be made from ultra-high molecular weight polythene fibers. These fibers will be designed to not restrict a soldier's movement, even with the added protection. This principle works in theory because polythene is a plastic and plastic is light. But this raises a question, how can a plastic protect you against gunfire, let alone a 50 caliber round? As you would expect, plastics melt at high enough temperatures, including the heat a bullet makes as it transfers its energy to a target. The melting fibers adhere to the bullet and slow it down allowing the other parts of the armor to stop it from penetrating and transfer its energy over a broader area. Because of its heavy use of plastics, the total weight of a set of Sotnik armor will supposedly be reduced by 20 pounds from the Ratnik family of armors. All in all, a set of Sotnik body armor will weigh around 44 pounds, according to Rostec. And as if all the cutting-edge technology wasn't enough, Rostec says it will develop an active titanium exoskeleton to integrate with the armor in the future. Rostec is researching power sources for how this feature would work. As early as 2021, however, there were some military and engineering experts who were skeptical about Russian claims. Since ancient times, armor has always been a compromise between protection and mobility. Too much protection leaves a wearer immobile. It's why some units from then to now chose not to wear any body armor at all. For them, mobility was their best protection. Other units preferred to fight with heavier armor because they did not expect to need a lot of mobility. The latest question in this age-old compromise is, can polythene armor capable of stopping a 50 caliber machine gun round be made lightweight enough for a soldier to actually be able to wear it and not be immobile? According to a 2021 analysis in Popular Mechanics, the answer was not promising. For comparison, a standard 7.62mm bullet transfers 1,878 pounds of force on its target. A 50 caliber Browning machine gun round is over four times that, at 11,070. To put that into perspective, this weight would be the same as if a 5-ton truck were sitting on your chest. American military gear can stop standard rifle rounds like 7.62mm, with a total weight on the soldier at 22.6 pounds. This is a good compromise between protection and mobility. Stopping a 50 caliber round is a whole different story, however. That would take 1.25 inches of AR-500 grade steel plate, but this type of steel is far too heavy to comfortably wear. It would make a modern soldier the equivalent of a caricatured version of a medieval knight wearing armor that was too heavy to move around in. The amount of polythene plastic that would be needed to stop a 50 caliber round, even accounting for greater efficiency, would almost certainly be impossible to wear on the battlefield and remain mobile. Popular mechanics mention that Russia could try to compensate for this reality by adding titanium plating to the ensemble of a far more realistic amount of polythene. Since titanium is lighter and stronger than steel, the idea seems feasible. There is also precedent for it. Armorers in the Soviet Union made body armor with titanium components during the Cold War. However, even with this modification, stopping a 50 caliber round and leaving a soldier mobile enough to move around would be very difficult. The verdict about the idea of body armor reliably stopping 50 caliber rounds? Feasible, but don't put your money on it. It's also worth mentioning that 50 caliber machine gun rounds can easily punch holes in cinder block walls. Even if the body armor does stop penetration, dispersing over 11,000 pounds of force safely around the human body 
would be difficult. The blunt force trauma from the impact of a 50 caliber round would still likely be enough to kill. So even if the logistics to outfit all of Russia's soldiers with Sotnik body armor by 2025 work out, and there is every reason, as we've seen by now, to believe that they won't, the Sotnik still has a long way to go to prove the Kremlin's claims. If we have not learned to doubt those by now, we have not learned anything from the 18-month war in Ukraine. But what do you think about Russia's next-generation Sotnik body armor? Does it even have a chance of living up to the claims the Kremlin makes of it? Let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. As of June 2023, Russian tank losses have exceeded a whopping 4,000 since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. That is a lot of tanks, and Putin's troubles don't end there. Russia will have a manpower shortage very, very soon unless Putin orders another wave of mobilization. But Ukrainian losses have not been insignificant either. So far, Ukraine has managed to constantly mobilize their soldiers and replace their losses. But how long before they start running out of manpower too? Will Putin run out of troops before Ukraine does? Let's hear what our military experts have to say. In February 2023, Word got out that a treasure trove of classified US documents had been leaked across the popular social media platform Discord. In those documents were some harsh assessments of the future of Ukraine's counteroffensive against Russia, who had begun their full-fledged invasion a year earlier in February 2022. The more than 100 documents included secret and top-secret files on foreign intelligence, analysis of opponent forces, and briefing documents for US military and government officials. One file in particular stood out. In its pages, the source claimed that Ukraine would be faced with significant force generation and sustainment shortfalls, and the probability that any Ukrainian offensive in 2023 would result in only modest territorial gains if not supported by a sufficient number of troops and hardware. This report was not the first time Ukraine was challenged on whether they had enough men to defeat the vastly larger country of Russia. It's been evident for some time that both Ukraine and Russia have seen a decline in their populations. For Ukraine, the 2014 invasion of the Donbass region and Crimea initiated their population decline. Their population loss has significantly increased since the February 2022 invasion, coupled with the indiscriminate bombing of civilian areas and brutalization of any population that didn't evacuate. Russia, despite having a vastly bigger population, has a vastly different problem. It's huge, aka hugely embarrassing losses of hardware. Russia's hardware problems in comparison to its troop losses are perhaps a more reliable indicator of just how bad the war has been going for them, since tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, trucks and artillery are big and bulky. Their losses are harder to hide and can be counted and identified more easily than individual soldiers. When analysts look at hardware losses Russia has suffered, the numbers are simply staggering. An analysis done by the Ukrainian general staff reports that Russian armed forces have lost over 3,900 tanks, 7,600 armored fighting vehicles, 6,400 unarmored vehicles and fuel tanks, 3,700 artillery systems, 600 multiple rocket launch systems MLRS, 350 air defense systems, more than 300 planes, 300 helicopters, 3,200 drones, and 18 ships. To put this all into perspective, Russia was believed to have only around 3,500 main battle tanks before the invasion. The best estimates were that they invaded Ukraine with a total ground force of around 150,000 soldiers. An update on June 21, 2023 from the same Ukrainian source suggested that the number of lost Russian tanks has just exceeded 4,000. While the estimate from Ukraine might be biased, those from neutral open-source group Oryx are not. They count only those weapon systems for which they can prove beyond a shadow of doubt that they were destroyed or captured and document each and every loss in their figures. They report as of June 13, 2023, Russia has lost, at a minimum, 2,070 tanks, 894 armored fighting vehicles, 2,454 infantry fighting vehicles, 318 armored personnel carriers, and thousands more mine-resistant vehicles, transports, mobile artillery, air defense systems, and various intelligence, supply, and command vehicles. Since Oryx only includes confirmed losses, even they admit Russia's real losses are much higher. There are several indications of how bad Russian material losses are. One of the most glaring is that Russia has been transporting 70 and 80-year-old tanks from storage yards and even museums and sending them by rail to the front. One such relic was a T-5455, 
that was packed with around six tons of explosives and sent trundling to the Ukrainian front lines, though it was blown up before it could reach them. That tank was built a few years after the end of World War II. Others just like it have been photographed heading towards the front lines from all over Russia. Another surprising display occurred during the 2023 May Day Parade through Red Square in Moscow. Normally, this was the yearly event when the supposedly mighty Russian military would parade its newest and most powerful military vehicles, from tanks, IFVs, and multiple launch rocket systems to portable ballistic missiles, all of them overflown by frontline fighters and strategic bombers. But this year, the world received a surprise when only a single World War II-era T-34 tank trundled through the parade. President Vladimir Putin was mocked around the world for such a weak display of supposed Russian military might. So it's pretty clear at this point that Russia is indeed running out of tanks, but does it have enough troops to defend its own cities? Even more embarrassing for Putin was the abortive March for Justice that his one-time chef and military oligarch Yevgeny Prigozhin launched for a brief 24-hour period from June 23rd through 24th. Prigazin's private military company, the Wagner Group, was able to capture the major city of Rostov-on-Don without firing a shot and weren't met with any substantial ground opposition until they were within 125 miles of Moscow itself. The only thing that apparently stopped Prigazin and Wagner was the failure of a popular uprising to join him. He certainly wasn't stopped by any military units. Most analysts believe that's because the vast majority of Russian military strength is all in Ukraine. Additional shortages of men and material have been seen in the Russian oblast of Belgorod, where a series of cross-border raids launched by free Russian opposition units, together with a small number of Polish expatriates fighting for Ukraine, have caused havoc for weeks. The minimal border security forces there have been wholly incapable of stopping them, not until they were supported by heavy artillery and air force strikes. Some reports say that the Russian defense units didn't even have weapons or ammo, since according to Russian law, it was illegal for them to carry firearms. What about the regular troops? Now that we've seen that Russia has suffered a probably massive loss in hardware and material, and doesn't even have enough troops to protect its own borders, we can better understand the level of their actual troop losses and possible remaining strength. According to the same Ukrainian general staff report mentioned earlier, Russia has lost a staggering 213,000 killed, wounded and missing soldiers, sailors and airmen. That analysis includes more than 43,000 killed in action and over 170,000 wounded, many of whom will not be returning to combat. The Independent Center for Strategic and International Studies CSIS, has come up with an even higher estimate. Their report from February 2023 indicated that Russia had lost as many as 250,000 total casualties. In comparison, this total from just the 12 months of fighting is more than all the combat losses Russia and the former Soviet Union had suffered in all their wars since World War II combined. The estimate of 250,000 casualties would have increased by an additional 60 to 70,000 casualties between February and June of 2023. In just the first three months of the invasion, Russia suffered as many casualties as it did during its entire 10-year war in Afghanistan. What's worse is that according to the most recent reports, their casualty rate may be increasing. Russia lost over 1,100 troops in a single day on June 8th, as Ukraine has begun to hammer Russian forces with its summer offensive. But what's causing such high casualty rates? One of the biggest causes of such casualties is the outdated method in which Russia is conducting the war. Overall, the Russian military doctrine has changed little since World War I. They rely on masses of inaccurate artillery supported by fighters that perform ground attack roles and masses of human assaults, sometimes, but not always, backed up by tanks. But the Russian Air Force, known as the SVS, has seen high losses as well, due to the large numbers of surface-to-air missiles sent by the US and NATO members. They've been reluctant to fly over Ukrainian territory and prefer to lob bombs from the safety of Russian-occupied territory. Russian doctrine also suggests that if the first human assault fails, keep sending in more troops until the defenders fold. Britain's Defense Intelligence Agency points out that such outdated tactics carry with them enormous losses. Their report states that a combination of poor, low-level tactics, limited air cover, a lack of flexibility and a command approach which is prepared to reinforce failure and repeat mistakes has led to Russia's high casualty rate among its troops in Ukraine. But here's the really bad part. These casualties primarily include the vets and the elite. Indeed, one of the most significant areas where Russia's casualties have had a telling effect has been in their elite units. An example of the losses such elite units have suffered can be seen in the current state 
of the 331st Guards Airborne Regiment, a part of the 98th Guards Airborne Division, one of the best trained and most experienced combat units Russia has available. Prior to the invasion, the 331st Regiment's size was around 1,500 to 1,700 soldiers. It sent two battalion groups into Ukraine at the start of the invasion on February 24, 2022, for a total of 1,000 to 1,200 men. They suffered heavily in the initial day's effort to capture Hostomel Airport, just outside of Kyiv. The lightly armored infantry vehicles that they were sent in with proved no match for Ukrainian anti-tank weapons and heavy artillery. An estimated 94 soldiers, almost 10% of their strength, were killed in just the first few days of fighting. By the end of the year, some accounts indicated their casualties numbered more than 500. Continued fighting showed that the unit was unprepared for the length of the war. Within just a few weeks of the invasion, locals back at the city of Kostroma, where the unit was based, were holding fundraising drives to send the troops warm clothes. The governor of the region, Sergei Sitnikov, a former CO of the 331st, commented a few months later that we need to help our guys so they have decent conditions. When he visited the wounded survivors, he bought with him care packages from relatives back home and civilian drones bought on the open market. If the conditions were this bad for one of Russia's most elite units, then it can only be much worse for the regular army troops. These same high casualty rates have been reported for all branches of Russia's armed forces, but since the best trained, most elite units are the ones that can be most trusted in a fight, those are the ones that can see the most intense combat, often spearheading assaults in battles around Mariupol, Bakhmut, and as we've seen with the 331st, the initial drives on Kyiv. The problem is, as Russia loses a significant portion of their combat veterans, they're being replaced with less well-trained and less skilled replacements. For a while, the Russian regular troops were supplemented by Prigazin's Wagner forces, widely regarded as some of the most experienced urban fighters Russia had left. But Prigazin's abortive march on Moscow resulted in him being exiled to Belarus, and his Wagner troops being split up between joining him in Belarus, signing contracts with the Ministry of Defense, or returning home to Russia. The Wagner forces had been responsible for the only sector where Russia had made any kind of incremental gains since the opening months of the invasion that being around the area of the eastern city of Bakhmut. According to the U.S. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby, who spoke to reporters on May 1, 2023, Russia had lost nearly 100,000 casualties in its 10-month siege of Bakhmut, including about 20,000 soldiers killed in combat and 80,000 wounded. Ukraine have lost about one-fifth as many in its defense of the city, according to U.S. intelligence estimates, or around 4,000 killed and up to 15,000 wounded. It was clear that within the first few months of the invasion that Russia had failed to allocate enough forces for the complete subjugation of Ukraine and had vastly underestimated the number of casualties they would suffer. In September 2022, Putin announced a mobilization of 120,000 new troops, while a law was also passed making it a crime for anyone in Russia to call the invasion a war. Those 120,000 weren't enough, however and further conscriptions raised the total to around 300,000 by the end of 2022. These nationwide call-ups have had a serious negative side effect. On top of losing a quarter of a million men as casualties of war, as many as one million additional young men and women have fled Russia to avoid the conscription. Many of those who left are the young professionals that Russia desperately needs and cannot replace. These emigres have left for various reasons, but their primary reason was to escape the mobilization along with fleeing the Western sanctions that have caused enormous economic distress within the nation. This has led to a significant manpower shortage across Russia. In an intelligence update released on May 27, 2023, the British Defense Ministry observed that a survey conducted by the Russian Central Bank involving 14,000 employees had determined that Russia's national labor force was at its lowest recorded level since 1998. In addition to losses from the war and emigration to avoid the draft, the survey also showed that the Russian population had previously decreased by up to 2 million in the years between 2020 and 2022, due to several factors, including the poor Russian response to the COVID pandemic, poor healthcare and diet, excessive alcoholism, and an increasingly aging population. Nowhere has this lack of workers been more acutely felt than in the tech sector, where shortages of trained workers have hit the electronics and programming sectors hard. This brain drain, along with continuing Western sanctions, has caused what Laura Solanko, a senior advisor for the Bank of Finland, described as reverse industrialization, 
This means Russia has not only seen a shrinking of its economy, but has had to replace overseas investment, lost due to Western sanctions, with funds supplied by the state. Solanko reported such policies can only succeed with huge investments in domestic production to replace lost imports as well as the construction of new transportation links to the east and south. As resources are limited, she continued, this implies less investment in other sectors, including potentially more productive areas. Russia's investments will continue to move away from the technological frontier, she said, which is why she considers Russia's current state of the economy as reverse industrialization. These factors combine to indicate that Russia will have increasingly fewer young men and women for Putin to draft in 2023, if he feels the need to repeat his previous mistake. On top of Russia's potentially catastrophic combat losses and manpower shortages, Russia is also facing another area of concern, the loss of their combat leadership. One of the most widely reported problems regarding the Russian army is a distinct lack of unity of command. Part of that problem is currently due to the combat losses which extend up the chain of command. As of November 2022, Russia had lost more than 1,500 officers in the first nine months of the war, according to estimates by Ukrainian Colonel Anatoly Stefan, and backed up by studies done by the US Center for Naval Analysis. These reports suggest an estimated 160 of those 1,500 lost officers were generals, major generals, and lieutenant generals, as well as more than 150 colonels and lieutenant colonels, 250 majors, 296 captains, and nearly 500 senior lieutenants, in descending order of rank. While confirmed numbers, as with the lost Russian hardware, suggest a much lower number is more likely, it's clear that whatever the actual total is, Russia is losing far more officers of higher ranks than most Western armies would under similar battlefield conditions. As noted previously, one of the few areas where Russian military has been successful is with its private military companies, like Wagner, but there have been highly publicized clashes between Prigozhin, Wagner's leader, and the Russian military leadership in Moscow. Prigozhin has complained on multiple occasions that his private military group's needs have not been met. Meanwhile, whenever a high-ranking officer from the regular Russian army was fired, Prigozhin has been hiring them and adding them to his own private army, further distancing himself from Moscow. Prigozhin's march on Moscow was responsible for another loss for Russia. General Sergei Sorovkin, the deputy commander of the Russian group of forces fighting in Ukraine, disappeared from public sight following the march and was rumored to be under arrest for knowing about Prigozhin's plan and not informing Putin. Sorovkin's disappearance will be keenly felt across the entirety of the Russian military, as he was one of the most reliable ground commanders in the army, having attained his rank through skill and accomplishments unlike those above him in the Russian chain of command who owed their position due to loyalty to Putin above all else. We've seen the many problems Russia is having with its troop losses and its population decline. How well is Ukraine doing in filling out its army? Ukraine has exceeded all expectations in lasting more than a year against a country nearly 30 times its size in area, 17 million square kilometers versus 603,000 square kilometers, and more than triple its size in population. 143 million versus 43 million for Ukraine. That widely accepted estimate of the Ukrainian population of roughly 43 million is contradicted by other sources. According to statistics compiled by England's The Economist newspaper, Ukraine, including Crimea and the Donbass, has lost about 16% of its population between its independence in 1991 from the former Soviet Union and the eve of the 2022 Russian invasion. These numbers suggest that Ukraine now has a population of only about 36 million, compared to around 52 million in 1991. But that's to be expected in a country where the invader, Russia, has indiscriminately attacked civilian population centers and has leveled whole cities, like Mariupol, which has seen its pre-war population of 400,000 reduced to less than 5,000. This same Russian effort to depopulate any area of resistance has been repeated across whole regions of Ukraine. According to the Joint Research Center of the European Economic Union the EU, Ukraine will continue to see a steady decline in its population over the next 20 to 30 years, even under the most optimistic of circumstances. The JRC has estimated that by the beginning of February 2023, around 5.3 million Ukrainian civilians had been displaced internally across Ukraine, while approximately 7 million had emigrated to other countries, with around 4 million of those fleeing to nearby EU countries especially Poland. This means that the invasion has displaced close to 30% of the entire Ukrainian population, both inside and outside of Ukraine, 
that accounts for the disparity between the pre-war estimates of 43 million for the Ukrainian population and the more recent 35 to 36 million figure. It would seem then that Ukraine could be facing a shortfall of the younger demographic that usually makes up military service recruits. However, those numbers belie the reality that an overwhelming number of volunteers have flooded the Ukrainian army, more than they can adequately train and supply. Since the beginning of the invasion in February 2022, Ukraine has seen a truly heroic response not just from within its own borders, but from abroad as well. An estimated 2,000 to 3,000 foreign fighters are believed to be serving in three battalions of a Ukrainian unit named the International Legion, according to analysts and academics monitoring them. But because the Ukrainian government wishes to keep such numbers private, these numbers are only best guess estimates. In the early months of the war, Ukrainian officials estimated that as many as 20,000 volunteers from more than 50 countries had arrived to help fight against the Russian invasion. But according to analysts and interviews with many of the foreign fighters who stayed, the vast majority appear to have returned home before the summer. Hundreds of the better-trained volunteers have since then been integrated into smaller units that operate independently of the International Legion. These groups, led by longtime regional opponents of Moscow such as the Georgian Legion and Chechen battalions, as well as other primarily Western units with names like Alpha, Phalanx and the Norman Brigade. Some of the volunteers who stayed are being used to train young Ukrainian recruits, though their training is often rudimentary. Where a Western nation like the US would spend up to 10 weeks of training in boot camp, the Ukrainian recruits often get as little as 3 to 5 days, though most will get around 2 to 3 weeks. It's not just the total number of troops that Ukraine has that should be considered, but also the troops who are trained well enough to survive the most dangerous first few weeks of their deployment. It's also clear that the numbers of Ukrainian men and women who volunteered were more than the Ukrainian army could train early in the war. More than 140,000 Ukrainians, mostly men, have returned from Europe. According to a social media post by Ukrainian Defense Minister Oleksiy Reznikov from March 2022, tens of thousands joined the territorial defense forces. According to the Ukrainian Interior Ministry, between 9 and 12 new assault brigades, totaling 40,000 men, have been training for months to help spearhead the current counteroffensive. Their numbers were swelled by countrywide media campaigns that called on young Ukrainians, both men and women, to join up to help rid their country of the Russian invaders. One of the leaked assessment documents from February 2023 titled Russia-Ukraine Assessed Combat Sustainability and Attrition, compiled by the US Defense Intelligence Agency, suggested that Ukraine had suffered as many as 130,000 total casualties, including 17,000 killed in action and another 113,000 wounded. Ukraine has been very tight-lipped about their own casualty figures, so these numbers are merely best-guess estimates. Overall, it can be seen that Ukraine does have less population from which to draw its military recruits, while sustaining very large losses over the first year of the war. Offsetting this has been a continued strong volunteer effort from both inside and outside Ukraine. The violence that Russia has unleashed on the Ukrainian civilians has convinced many in Ukraine, who would normally let others do the fighting, to step up and join their country in defending against the Russian invaders. No matter how long this war goes on, whether for months or years, it doesn't appear that Ukraine will run out of highly motivated volunteers anytime soon. The original question, will Russia run out of troops before Ukraine does, seemed at first to be an easily answered question. With three times the population, it would have appeared that Russia would simply be able to wear down Ukraine over years of relentless grinding warfare. But the reality is, Russia's military is on the brink of collapse. Their best units have been shattered, and their ranks have been filled with ill-trained, poorly supplied, and poorly led conscripts. Their once vaunted dominance in tanks is now just a memory, and their artillery is being outfought and outshot by more accurate and longer range systems supplied by the West. Russia's air force can't gain air superiority over the battlefield, while Russia's economy is so drastically damaged that they simply cannot replace the losses they've suffered in high-tech weapons. Ukraine appears motivated enough and well enough equipped that, if the war were to last another year or another 10, they'd never run out of people willing to fight to remove the last Russian occupier from their land. But what do you think? How close is Putin to completely running out of soldiers? Will Ukraine continue to be successful in replacing their short-term manpower deficit? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. What if there are more Russians who want to overthrow Putin than he thinks? What if those Russians took up arms against him? Guess what? Much of this is already happening, 
and these groups of dissident Russian partisans are now launching raids on the territory of their own country. But who are these anti-Putin Russians and what do they mean for the war? Here's what you need to know about the Freedom of Russia Legion and the Russian Volunteer Corps, two groups of Russian dissidents who are fighting against Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Let's get started. When Vladimir Putin launched his full-scale invasion of Ukraine on February 24, 2022, most international observers expected the fight to be a mostly defensive war on the part of Ukraine and that hostilities would be confined to Ukrainian soil. Putin and his inner circle felt the same way, sure in their ability to win the war rapidly. They believed that attacks on Russian territory were an inconceivable possibility. But Ukraine proved its deep offensive capability as early as April of that year when the Moskva, the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, mysteriously sank. Since then, Ukraine has demonstrated a capability to reach assets deep into Russian-controlled areas, such as the attack on the Crimean Bridge in the fall of 2022 and several missile and drone strikes into Russia itself. Now attacks on the Russian homeland are scaling up as the war that Putin started comes more and more into his own territory. At the beginning of the war, Ukraine put out a call to foreign fighters to bear arms against the invaders alongside its native soldiers. Thousands of people from all over the world took up the offer, but perhaps most surprising were the Russians who defected from their own country in order to fight on the side of Ukraine. To them, the basic reason was simple. Vladimir Putin and his regime in the Kremlin are not the same as Russia itself. And as long as the former remains in power, the latter will suffer, with the war being the primary piece of evidence. Two groups of fighters with this assumption in mind joined the fight in Ukraine and are cooperating with the Ukrainian military. They are known as the Freedom of Russia Legion and the Russian Volunteer Corps, respectively. Although the details are secret, the Freedom of Russia Legion spokesman, who goes by the name Caesar, claims that the group has several hundred members, all of them being Russians, who seek the downfall of the Putin regime. However, Caesar may be understating the number of personnel that the Legion has to call upon in order to deceive the enemy. The true number of soldiers in this fighting force may be higher and stretch into the thousands. The Legion fights under a blue, white, and blue flag, which it calls the flag of Free Russia. The group paints an L on its vehicles for liberty in opposition to the Russia's army letter Z. The purported political representative of the group is Ilya Ponomarev, a Russian politician in exile who says the group's goal is to liberate Russia from Putinism. Whether it has any goals beyond the removal of Putin from power remains unclear. The numbers are hard to come by for the Russian Volunteer Corps, which unlike the Legion has neo-Nazi leanings. The leader of this group is a man named Denis Kapustin or Denis Nikitin. He and his group's members have a goal to create an ethnostate composed of Russians, something they ironically believe Ukraine was doing a better job of than their own homeland. The Russian Volunteer Corps also has links to the controversial Azov Assault Brigade, more commonly known as the Azov Battalion, a group founded in Ukraine in 2014 that has also been controversial for its supposedly neo-Nazi ideological leanings. As a result, the existence of the Russian Volunteer Corps within Ukraine's foreign volunteer units is something of a problem for Ukraine and its Western allies. Its extremist political leanings provide assistance to the Kremlin's propaganda that the full-scale war was launched to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Unfortunately, war more often than not presents no choice but to make alliances of convenience. Ukraine needs all the help it can get, and as we'll soon see, the Russian Volunteer Corps has proven a capable fighting force useful for the Ukrainian cause. Either way, since the appearance of these units alongside the Ukrainian ranks, the number of strange incidents behind the Russian border has grown. For example, arson attacks on Russian territory have increased. In December 2022, there was a large fire in the Moscow region, which Russian officials said had been set deliberately. Over 100 arson attacks have occurred in Russia since the formation of the Freedom of Russian Legion, ones which are different from the burning of recruitment centers from disgruntled draftees. Unlike those incidents, these attacks have occurred on higher-profile targets. They include burnings of chemical plants, the home of a governor, fuel depots, military bases, government buildings such as the FSB building and financial bureaus, the Admiral Kuznetsov aircraft carrier, the defense ministry's headquarters, and critical businesses such as the manufacturer for the Russian military's night vision equipment. Such targeted attacks suggest that Ukrainian intelligence was in on the operations, possibly with the help of higher-ups in the Russian regime. Inside jobs, if you will. These two groups may be cooperating with the Legion and Volunteer Corps 
in the conduct of such attacks, but obviously the details are secret and we cannot know for sure. What we do know is that both the Legion and the Volunteer Corps have been hardened by battle in Ukraine, including the battle for the city of Bakhmut, which Russia claimed to fully capture on May 21, 2023. After nine months of brutal World War I-style fighting, Putin and his regime did not have long to celebrate the triumph though, as the Kremlin could hardly expect the surprise that would come on its doorstep the next day at the hands of these two groups. They would take the war to Russian soil in a much more direct way than anything seen before. Before discussing the raid in May, though, a little elaboration is worthwhile. The Belgorod raid was not the first time that these two groups had demonstrated an ability to conduct operations on Russian soil. Earlier in 2023, they were building experience in small-scale missions across the border. The Volunteer Corps had made a stir in Russian territory in early March 2023 when it launched an operation in Bryansk Oblast. There, an attack force that Russia accused of coming from Ukraine took several civilians hostage and destroyed a car. The Russian Volunteer Corps did not confirm or deny this, but adamantly insisted they were not Ukrainians and that their attack demonstrated the internal weakness of the Putin regime. The Volunteer Corps then invited Russians at home to free themselves from Putin's regime before withdrawing back across the border. The State Border Guard Service of Ukraine denied that the March attack ever took place. It claimed that any accusations of its existence were a propaganda operation on behalf of the aggressor country. The cross-border attacks escalated dramatically on May 22, 2023, with a joint operation into Russian territory between the Legion and the Volunteer Corps. The operation involved the use of at least one tank and several armored vehicles. The column first stormed past a Russian border checkpoint into Belgorod Oblast and drove toward the border settlements. Soon afterward, the two groups then claimed that they had liberated several towns, including Kozinka and Grevoron, the capital of the district. Once the Legion and Volunteer Corps had penetrated into Russian territory and captured the towns, the groups announced they were creating a demilitarized zone. Further, they declared, they would continue their operations with one objective in mind, the liberation of all of Russia from Putin's dictates and the end of the criminal war. Unlike the raid in early March, this was a serious sustained operation that lasted for two days with boots on the ground behind the Russian border. The local government announced civilian evacuations, with the governor of Belgorod Oblast, Vyacheslav Gladlov, saying that at least one civilian woman born in 1941 had died during the evacuation measures. The governor directly blamed Ukraine for the raid, accusing the fighters involved in it of being a reconnaissance and sabotage group of the armed forces of Ukraine. According to the governor, the cross-border raid also included mortar strikes on the village of Kozinka and a fire in a hay warehouse in a town called Gorapodo. Additionally, he said that the fragmentation of a missile had fallen into the garden of a house located in the village of Antonovka. In addition to occupying several towns near the border, the Legion and Volunteer Corps were heading straight for the Belgorod 22 facility, a base which stores some of Russia's nuclear weapons. The Russians threw all hands on deck to remove these weapons from the premises as the most advanced units from the invading force came within a few miles of the base. No nuclear weapons were unaccounted for, but the incident was a close call and ironically, had it succeeded, the United States may have had to get involved on behalf of the Russians to ensure that such weapons of mass destruction did not fall into the hands of unknown actors. Given the Volunteer Corps' neo-Nazi sympathies, it could have been particularly damaging if this group were to secure the leverage that comes from holding nuclear weapons. After the initial chaos and confusion, Russia launched a counterattack, which it called a counter-terrorist operation. The distinction was important, as it allowed local leaders to more tightly regulate the communications and the movements of civilians in the area. Russia claimed that its counterattack killed 70 enemy fighters, which it says were Ukrainian and not Russian, since according to the Kremlin, neither the Legion nor the Volunteer Corps exist, despite their official designation as terror groups by the Supreme Court of Russia. At the end of the aforementioned two days, the Legion and the Volunteer Corps retreated back behind the Ukrainian border, after downing at least one of the helicopters the Russians used in their counter-raid. Their account of losses was vastly different from the Russian casualty figures. Over the course of the entire two-day raid, the Legion claims it suffered two fatalities with ten wounded, while the Volunteer Corps says it suffered no fatalities and two wounded. The groups also claim to have captured at least one Russian armored vehicle and taken several prisoners from their enemy's counterattack force. 
At the start of June, the Legion and Volunteer Corps announced they were launching another attack into Russian territory. The Legion put out the following statement, We, the Freedom of Russia Legion, are now near the border of our homeland. Very soon we will advance again on the territory of Russia to bring freedom, peace, and tranquility. Gravaron is only the beginning. According to Russian authorities, there was shelling and fighting throughout the night, with civilians in the area being asked to not leave their homes and to remain calm. The local authorities insisted that there is no breakthrough of the armed forces of Ukraine. On June 5, 2022, the Legion and Volunteer Corps made yet another announcement. The groups claimed that they had killed a colonel in the Russian army, Andrei Stesev, in the territory of Belgorod Oblast. According to their statement, he died in battle like an officer with a weapon in his hands, but we must admit that these hands are covered up to the elbows in blood. On his orders, he and his subordinates had systematically terrorized the population of Belgorod Oblast and violated their rights and freedoms. Earlier, Stesev killed civilians in Chechnya, Yugoslavia, Abkhazia, and Ukraine. Video later surfaced confirming these boasts. Also at the start of June, the Legion and Volunteer Corps announced that they had captured Russian prisoners in Belgorod Oblast and wanted to meet with the governor. They offered to free the prisoners if the governor met with them to discuss the current situation in the region and most importantly to talk about its future and the future of Russia in general. The proposed meeting place was the church in Novaya Tavozonka. They did not say whether these were the prisoners captured in the raid at the end of May, new ones taken from the supposed second wave of fighting, or another operation. And the role of these groups in the conflict is far from over. On June 8, 2023, Newsweek reported that Russian soldiers fighting near the border town of Shabikina, Belgorod Oblast, had complained about the Legion on the Skov Province Telegram channel. They said, I would like to see the story of our regiment being slaughtered in the Shabinka and Graveron directions and somehow put the matter to rest. The soldiers added that they were under constant bombardment by enemy artillery and that ordinary soldiers and their relatives were being killed. They also complained about poor leadership in their army and a lack of reinforcements. The unit's message concluded, We are ready to defend our homeland, but with proper supplies and to be taken prisoner without arms or with no possibility to counteract is not defending the homeland. On behalf of the 1009th Regiment, we ask you to look into this serious problem and make decisions as soon as possible. The unit that made these complaints is reportedly a conscript one, made up of soldiers mobilized in Putin's partial draft from last fall. Unverified social media videos published around the same time showed Russian units in Belgorod Oblast in retreat, claiming that they were being mowed down and needed reinforcements. All of these operations would be in line with a statement made by Alexei Baranovsky, another of the Legion's political officials. He said that the minimum plan is to create a demilitarized zone on the borders with Ukraine so that Putinists cannot fire ground equipment at the territory of Ukraine from here. This would be, he said, a preparation for the group's main objective, a swift march on Moscow. The latter claim is far closer to hyperbole than reality. But the Legion and Volunteer Corps looks set to become even more important as the war enters its next phase after the Battle of Bakhmut. Every war has irregular forces which can upset the balance of power disproportionately to their size. The Legion and Volunteer Corps have demonstrated that ability. For example, during the May raid on Belgorod, the total invasion force from both anti-Putin groups amounted to less than 100 men and yet caused chaos and panic within the Russian ranks far in disproportion to its size. It was, by any objective criteria, a spectacular success and another embarrassment for Russia, proving how vulnerable its homeland really is to a well-coordinated attack. Further raids are likely. Propaganda about future raids to deceive the Russian war machine are even more likely. Ukrainian intelligence certainly had a part to play in the Belgorod raid and will be eager to assist in further raids and deception efforts as part of a much grander design. Many military observers believe that the attack into Russia at the end of May was part of a shaping operation for the Ukrainian counteroffensive that has supposedly been coming for months. If Russia needs to divert more forces to protect its own territory, it will have less on hand in Ukraine to defend the land it now holds there. Causing chaos within the Russian homeland is also a great way to divert the Kremlin's attention from what Ukraine is planning to do on the front, as it must defend its territory and people or risk losing even more face with a Russian public that's already been under economic stress and which has grown wary after the botched mobilization in the fall of 2022. Unfortunately for the Ukrainians, substantial operations on Russian soil have been a taboo since the war began. 
Because their allies in the West are not keen to let them undertake such efforts, the United States and other NATO countries have pressured Ukraine to not bring the war to Russian soil, fearing an escalation of the conflict. Such fears are also why the West has been reluctant to provide Ukraine with long-range offensive weapons, such as certain missiles for HIMARS and advanced fighter jets. Until the start of 2023, the West was reluctant to provide Ukraine with advanced battle tanks for similar reasons. This taboo makes sense from the West's perspective. NATO and other like-minded countries do not intend to destabilize or overthrow the Putin regime in Moscow, despite all the Russian propaganda. Rather, their goal is to contain Russian influence by restoring Ukraine's territorial integrity and keeping Kyiv as independent as possible from Moscow. Both goals will be easier to achieve if Ukraine joins NATO after the war, which according to its Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg in April 2023, is an outcome that all participating countries in NATO have agreed upon. During the war itself, however, NATO and Ukraine's interests are not entirely in alignment. This makes sense. Because for NATO, there are worse things in the world than Vladimir Putin and his regime. A destabilized Russia with its thousands of nuclear weapons would be a much bigger problem for the West than even the current invasion of Ukraine. Although this is a remote possibility, it is too terrible to consider. The raid that came so close to the Belgorod 22 nuclear storage facility must have strengthened those convictions in the minds of Western leaders. Western goals are not achieved by bringing the fight to Russia, which they want defeated in Ukraine but politically stable in its homeland. This divergence of interests has allowed the Russians to concentrate their military resources on invading and annexing territory in Ukraine. The lack of ability to retaliate on Russian soil means that Putin and his regime can more easily carry out their operations without fear of maximum retaliation. Ukraine has been in a bind though, because without Western aid, it would not be able to withstand the onslaught of Russian military, so it has had no choice but to accede to the wishes of its allies. As a result, Ukraine's offensive ability has been limited. Despite the successes in the Kharkiv and Kherson counteroffensives in the late summer and fall of 2022, the Legion and Volunteer Corps, therefore, give Ukraine more options. Their existence allows the Ukrainian High Command to carry out more gray zone and asymmetrical operations. The raid into Russian territory was not a full-scale invasion, but it did tie down resources and cause panic in the Russian High Command. More operations like it, potentially with even more men and armor, are therefore likely as the war moves into the next phase. At the very least, the threat of further attacks into Russian territory will keep the Kremlin guessing and on its toes, diverting attention from the Ukrainian High Command's true strategy. The Legion and Volunteer Corps may just prove to be one more valuable tool in Ukraine's arsenal if they can be fully unleashed in this capacity. With the West tacitly accepting the idea of Russians fighting against Putin's regime in limited operations on Russian soil, don't be surprised to see further action over the border to coincide with the much-anticipated 2023 Ukrainian counteroffensive. While all eyes are focusing on Donbass and Zaporizhia as the likeliest locations for Ukraine's next move, bolder attacks into Russian territory in the near future might just be even less surprising. But what do you think? Are these Russian partisan groups helping tip the scale in the Russo-Ukrainian war and aid in Ukraine's victory over Putin's aggression? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Putin is terrified of F-16s in Ukraine, and he should be. Since basically the beginning of the Russian invasion, Ukraine has been pleading with its Western supporters for advanced fighter jets. For most of the war, the US has been staunchly opposed to giving Ukraine these systems, as they could allow for strikes far behind Russian lines, escalating the conflict. But now, officials in Kyiv might be finally getting their wish, in the form of US-made F-16s set to be delivered later this year. As of this video, the training for Ukrainian F-16 pilots has begun in Denmark, and is set to begin in multiple other NATO countries such as the Netherlands. Back at the annual G7 summit in May, with Ukraine's Zelensky as a special guest, US President Joe Biden announced that the US would conduct its own training for Ukrainian F-16 pilots, which it estimated could be completed in under a year, with basic training possibly taking only four months. But where might all these jets be coming from? How important are they to Ukraine? And perhaps most importantly, how could they change the outcome of this brutal and unpredictable war? Let's start with the question of where exactly the F-16s might be coming from. There are more than 2,200 F-16s around the world, 
making it the most popular combat aircraft in use today. But the most likely candidates seem to be jets recently retired by the Netherlands, Denmark, and Norway. These would likely be the F-16 AMBM models, which were originally acquired in the 1980s and upgraded in the 1990s. All of these would therefore be aging aircraft with high mileage and old radar systems. But even with these drawbacks, the jet's software allows them to use some of the most modern and deadly weapons in the NATO arsenal, including the AIM-120 air-to-air missiles and stealthy long-range joint air-to-surface standoff missiles, or JASMs. Reports suggest that the Netherlands in particular was closely involved in the effort to get Washington to approve the F-16 training, helping convince Biden of their need in Ukraine. Interestingly, however, the F-16s aren't coming from the US at all. This is probably partially due to the tensions with China, for which the Pentagon is keeping significant material in reserve in case an air or naval battle breaks out over the Taiwan Strait or South China Sea. The other main reason is that US policymakers still worry that too aggressive or successful a strike by Ukraine could force Putin's hand in ways we'd all rather not think about. That was the rationale behind the strategy so far. Give Ukraine as many surface-to-air and land capabilities as possible while avoiding the potential of an aerial strike inside Russian territory. But this logic has already been challenged by Ukraine's use of drones in so-called shaping operations in recent weeks some of which have reached as far as Moscow. Because of this, the authorization for Ukraine to receive F-16s and the associated training has been a matter of tension in Washington for months. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and several others have objected to the idea, essentially claiming that there were too many unknowns and that Ukraine has done well enough without F-16s. So the approval for other countries to ship their F-16s to Ukraine is still a big change, overriding a key condition baked into their initial sale by the US, which prohibited European allies from sending them elsewhere. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was apparently one of the driving forces behind the administration's decision, as well as helping to convince European NATO allies to get on board. Yet even so, it's unclear when any of these countries will actually be supplying the F-16s in question. The Netherlands, Belgium and Denmark are working towards replacing their current F-16s with more advanced F-35s, but have all held back on actually committing to sending the old jets to Ukraine. Similarly, the UK has offered to provide flight training, but doesn't actually operate any F-16s itself. While this may start to change once the training is complete, there's currently a lot of hesitation from the West about pushing Putin just a little too far and ending up in some sort of nuclear standoff. Some countries like Belgium also worry about diminishing their own capabilities. Not that Belgium is a likely candidate to be invaded by anyone, Others, like Denmark, have stated that they will reconsider sending F-16s if others are also doing so, but that they won't go it alone. The Netherlands and Norway appear to be similarly torn, while other countries with F-16s not in the process of being phased out are much less likely to join in. In a nutshell, at the moment it's pretty clear that even those countries which have declared support for Ukraine's push for jets either can't or aren't willing to provide significant numbers of them in the short to medium term. Once Ukraine actually gets the aircraft, there's another set of problems it needs to deal with. Specifically, they must be able to operate, maintain, and sustain the F-16s, which is not the easiest task. For instance, a March 2023 study by the Congressional Research Service identified several crucial conditions necessary to successfully field the jets. The biggest concerns it identified concern the supply chain. This means acquiring sufficient spare parts, allocating funding for operations and support, implementing a maintenance inventory system, training maintainers, and acquiring an ongoing supply of weapons with which to arm their F-16s. These tasks are difficult enough for countries in peacetime, with previous experience and a wide base of technical knowledge. For Ukraine, they are likely to be even trickier. Of course, if the course of the war so far is anything to judge by, Ukrainians will continue to figure out inventive solutions to logistical issues facing their military. Russians, on the other hand, have no hope of obtaining advanced fighter jets and are stuck using obsolete human wave tactics while trying to avoid kicking off a civil war in their own country. But even accounting for the staggering incompetence of the Russian military, Ukraine certainly still faces some hurdles obtaining and operating even used F-16s. If they take to the skies without plans to support these aircraft, they will break down quickly and most likely become expensive stationary targets for Russian air-to-surface missiles. This is especially true for the F-16, which can require some 18 hours of maintenance for every hour of flight time. Basically, if they do things right and don't rush it, there's a strong possibility 
that Ukraine won't even be using the F-16s until the end of 2023. This also suggests that many defense experts believe the war will continue for quite some time, despite the incompetence of the Russian armed forces and short mutiny of the Wagner Group PMC. By greenlighting the transfer of the F-16s, the US is essentially admitting that the war will not stop anytime soon, and that Ukraine will need continual upgrades to its firepower in a long-term war of attrition. If Ukraine can get a handle on the jet's supply and maintenance, that's when the training will really start to become important. Like any complex weapon system, the F-16 was designed to fill a particular set of roles in an existing military structure and support certain doctrines of modern warfare. To get the most out of them, the Ukrainians will need to adopt more of the practices and techniques which the plane's design caters to. Fundamentally, the F-16 was designed to help the US Air Force beat the Russian Air Force in aerial combat. Logic follows that the more the Ukrainians can fly them like the US Air Force would, the better the results will be. Of course, other NATO countries have adopted similar practices, but most of these are also quite different from the ways Ukraine has been fielding their existing fighter jets. For one thing, the F-16 was essentially designed to be a lightweight, multi-role fighter capable of doing many different missions well, but not to be the best at any of them. F-16s were definitely not intended to be operated from improvised airfields as Ukraine has been doing with many of its current aircraft. They can be especially susceptible to getting debris caught in their engines, a great way to crash before ever engaging in combat. This brings up the issue of where Ukraine would put the 200 F-16s it's asking for. RAND Corporation analysts John Hone and William Courtney recently assessed that F-16s do best on long, pristine runways. They could face difficulties on the rougher, former Soviet ones dispersed across Ukraine. To bring in Western aircraft, Ukraine might need to repave and potentially extend a number of runways, a process which Russia would likely detect. If only a few airfields were suitable and in known locations, focused Russian attacks could impede Ukrainian F-16s from flying. This is mostly because idiotic and unprepared as most of Russia's military might be, they still have access to some pretty advanced technology. This is especially true when it comes to air-to-air -air combat. Modern Russian air fighters such as the MiG-31 and Su-35 can see quite far with their powerful modern radars. They also have R-37 missiles that have a longer range than NATO-supplied AIM-120 AMRAMs or advanced medium-range air-to-air missiles. In other words, Russian aircraft can potentially spot Ukrainian F-16s and shoot them down before the Ukrainian pilots see them coming. Some of this has already happened with Ukraine's current fleet of Su-27 and MiG-29 fighters, and the improved capabilities of the F-16 are not enough to change this dynamic. Because of the reach of these Russian fighters, Ukrainian fighter pilots often break off missions early or operate far behind their own front lines. F-16s would operate with the same constraints, limiting their ability to perform air-to-surface missions with relatively short-range weapons like the JDAM bomb guidance kits. Because of this, even once Ukraine receives F-16s, it will still most likely have to rely on drones and other current air platforms for support. There's also the question of how to get the proper armaments Ukraine needs to pair with the F-16s. The best way for Ukraine to capitalize on any F-16s it receives will be advanced Western armaments which can stand up to Russian firepower. The issue, like everything else in a war, these can be staggeringly expensive. For instance, a single AMRAM costs about $1.2 million while it takes about two years to make one. The US could always provide existing weapons like the AMRAM from its own stockpiles, but that could leave them depleted in the event of an unexpected conflict, a risk the Pentagon is not willing to take. However, the real tactical and logistical advantages that F-16s would provide to Ukraine are long-term. A major benefit is that it will be easier for Ukraine to maintain aircraft whose parts are supplied by the United States and NATO than their current, outdated aircraft manufactured by Russia. In turn, this could also make it easier for Ukraine to integrate their air force into NATO sometime in the future, and the more Ukraine's arsenal is compatible with NATO's, the better they'll fare, and the worse off Putin will find himself. For instance, Ukraine was previously given AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation missiles harm, to use against ground-based radar systems. As with much of their current military arsenal, they managed to attach the system onto their MiG-29s, but the end result was far from ideal, since Soviet-era fighters were not designed to fire US-manufactured missiles. F-16s with modern software will enable Ukraine to employ harms and other modern weapon systems much more effectively. This includes missiles such as the AIM-9 Sidewinder and the AIM-120, 
which the United States and NATO are likely to provide, will be useful for Ukraine's defense against Russian cruise missiles like the Kh-101 and the Kh-555, and against Iranian-made Shahed Kamikaze drones. Ukraine's stockpiles of Soviet S-300 surface-to-air missiles are running out pretty quickly, and there are only so many Patriot missiles available. So even if Russia will still have some superior jets, the F-16's air-to-air capability will definitely help those ground-based defenses last longer, and it's pretty clear that this is necessary. Western military analysts have estimated that Ukraine's combined fleet belonging to air and ground forces has been depleted by more than a third since the Russian invasion began. Ukraine has lost at least 60 of its 145 fixed-wing planes and 32 of 139 helicopters, according to classified US military information leaked on the social media platform Discord in recent months. The Ukrainian Air Force rarely reveals numbers regarding its fleet or other details of tactical importance, including incidents of planes shot down or otherwise destroyed, but officials have acknowledged losses from the more than a year of war, as well as difficulties with the repair and replacement of damaged planes. Another big question is whether the United States will supply powerful JASMs to use with the F-16s. These deadly, low-detection cruise missiles are incredibly long-range and have a 1,000-pound armor-piercing warhead. It also seems there's a good chance of this happening. Britain has provided the Storm Shadow air-launched cruise missiles, and Ukraine has already put them to use. Storm Shadow is generally similar to the baseline version of JASM in terms of size, range, employment, and observability so providing JASMs would not necessarily be an escalation. F-16s utilizing JASMs could allow for Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov's stated long-term plan to retake Crimea without a fight. Carrying out such a plan would require cutting off Russian troops in Crimea from their supply lines via the Kerch Strait Bridge, ports like Sevastopol and the land route from the Russian city of Rostov-on-Don. JASMs could give Ukraine the ability to fire on and destroy logistic hubs like naval bases, ammunition depots, bridges, and command and control facilities deep within Crimea. It could also serve as an alternative to the surface-to-air ATAC-M's missile, which Ukraine has requested but not yet received. The United States has quite a few more JASMs than ATAC-M's, so it might be willing to supply them to augment Ukraine's current arsenal of storm shadows. Another area F-16s could be helpful to Ukraine is as a good old-fashioned deterrent. While Putin clearly has no desire for the war to end, he was recently forced to replace General Sergei Sorovkin due to his involvement in the Wagner Group's attempted coup against Putin himself. Sorovkin was widely known as one of Russia's most trigger-happy commanders, willing to launch indiscriminate attacks against the civilian population of Ukraine. But whoever he gets replaced with may be less gung-ho about ordering air and drone strikes on Kyiv especially if Ukraine has 200 F-16s with which to respond. While there's little chance that Russian attacks will stop in the east, Ukraine having advanced fighter jets may give it enough of an edge in the air that attacks in the west of the country are diminished. The fact that Ukrainian jets and helicopters have been forced to attack cautiously for the entire war means that F-16s and their longer-range weaponry could prove very useful here. Ukrainian pilots have developed a tactic of flying low, unleashing unguided rockets from Ukrainian territory then immediately backing away to avoid anti-aircraft fire. Russian aircraft use similar tactics but have the advantage of superior firepower, which allows them to fire rockets and gliding bombs from a greater distance. A recent report from the Royal United Services Institute assessed that because of these tactics, even a small number of Western fighters could have a major deterrent effect. While F-16s likely will not grant Ukraine air superiority, they will make the defense of the country's airspace easier and if paired with JASMs or similar weapons, provide an important means of launching the type of long-range weapons which are likely necessary to force Russia out of Crimea and other fortified areas. A group of Ukrainian parliament members speaking at the German Marshall Fund in Washington in April said they wanted the F-16 because its radar can locate targets on the ground hundreds of miles away, allowing pilots to stay safely over Ukrainian-held territory while launching weapons into Russian-occupied areas. In addition to defense and deterrence, this also suggests that F-16s could feature in the later stages of the counteroffensive currently underway, which could take the entire rest of the year. Colonel Yuri Inat, a spokesman for the Ukrainian Air Force, seemed to confirm this, telling the New York Times that F-16s could provide cover for Ukrainian troops trying to advance and hold formerly occupied areas. He noted that it could also be used to cut off Russian planes that have started launching guided missiles more than 30 miles from the Ukrainian front line. 
to defend the sea route that lets Ukrainian grain leave the country and to push further into the Russian-occupied oblasts. All of this helps explain why the Kremlin seems so nervous about the possibility of F-16s in Ukrainian hands. When it became clear that the US would greenlight their training and eventual transfer, Russian diplomats had a minor meltdown. First, Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rybakov said any transfer of the US jets to Ukraine would be pointless, since Russia's capabilities are more than enough to end the special military operation whenever they want. Now, by this point, we probably don't need to tell you that that's pure BS. When that was pointed out, Russian ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Antonov, went on to claim that even if the F-16s were transferred, they couldn't possibly be effective, since Ukraine lacks the proper infrastructure, pilots, and maintenance personnel. While this is slightly more true, given the country's incredible adaptability so far, there's no reason to think that Ukraine can't make F-16s work, given the right amount of time and training. The Kremlin knows this, and it seems to be making their threats increasingly desperate. When the statements by Antonov and Rybakov failed to scare NATO or the US, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov took the stage during a speech at a military conference in Tajikistan. He claimed that, we must keep in mind that one of the modifications of the F-16 can accommodate nuclear weapons. If they do not understand this, then they are worthless as military strategists and planners. This is obviously pretty ironic considering Russia's continual failures in military planning for the last year, but also shows a deep-seated worry from top officials. They likely don't think that the US would ever give Ukraine nuclear warheads, but know that even if F-16s do not change the battle space in the short term, they will bring Ukraine closer to the West and increase the country's military resilience. The West's response to these threats was also summed up pretty well in the reply to Lavrov by Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby that, if you're worried about Ukrainian military capabilities, then you should take your troops and leave Ukraine. This back and forth over F-16s highlights a larger trend in the war, that Ukraine's warfighting increasingly looks like that of the West, rather than a former Soviet satellite state. Because Russia failed so badly to understand the depth of Ukrainian resolve, Every step Putin and his cronies take pushes Ukraine towards NATO, the EU, and the US. By the end of the war, whenever that might come, Ukraine will have extremely close military, economic, and political ties to Europe and America. The F-16s are just the latest part of this broader shift, but the fact that their transfer has been approved is another sign that the Ukraine of 2021 is not the same as the one we see today. War has transformed the country into a major regional military power with advanced equipment and some of Europe's most battle-hardened troops. Even though Putin somehow hasn't learned his lesson yet, there's no doubt that Ukraine will play a major role in the future of European security. But what do you think? What does the transfer of F-16s to Ukraine mean for the future of the conflict? And will it be enough to overcome Russia's military? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis.